Meeting is called to order the Finance Committee meeting of uh, November 18th. Deliver one thing for us with pledge of allegiance. Aye. In attendance in today's meeting is uh, uh, Mr. Councilman Molesky, uh, President of Council uh, uh, Mark DeBreeze, uh, Mr. Winkle, uh, Holly Swank, as well as the Mayor, Safety Service Director, Auditor, uh, Clerk of Courts, and uh, our illustrious uh, service department, headed up by uh, Mr. Montgomery. And I'll let Mr. Montgomery introduce the rest of your staff. Uh, Anthony Oliva, our street foreman. Ryan O'Grady, our water sewer foreman. Rick is our department uh, city garage <coughs> foreman. And Ray is uh, heading up the storm utility uh, foreman. Welcome, gentlemen. Okay. I will. Uh, Start this off and let you uh, continue, uh, go on with your presentation. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So all you guys just got this paper that's that's highlighted. Here we start this meeting off with um, talking about something that I think is the most important is uh, priority of the five departments that we have in one. Um, I know we're going to get into talking about roads. We're going to get into talking about machinery and all that. Um, I really want to highlight um, this area of importance because the guys that are highlighted, even though I think we have 48 in our department right now, we're down to, um, but we have this number. The reason I highlighted this, these are guys in that position that they have to be in there every day. Everybody else in this uh, that's not highlighted is normal, uh, flexible between street, water, sewer, storm, um, and water. So when I say that to you guys and we talk about paving and we're gonna get into it, I really wanna highlight last year we talked about ways to um, do other things and save money. But I think what we need to do so we're not uh, pulling guys from other departments and we get more done throughout the city, um, you know, spring, summer, fall is very short when we're doing paving and we have uh, time that we have to do dura patching and patching and panel grinding and things of that nature. And then Brian has his hydrants, his basins, uh, not to mention the water breaks or water leaks or any type of things like that that pop up during a day. Um, reason I'm telling you guys all this is I think collectively we have to come up with a number for paving that is, that is comfortable, that we know we can accomplish. Um, by doing those roads and then getting to everything else. Because I think, um, you know, when we're pulling people from uh, storm to run the rollers or from water and sewer to run the rollers or to help with the paved jobs, um, you know, there's other things that are lacking, you know what I mean? And um, I gave you guys a sheet uh, that's under here that you'll see that's crossroads, the proposal. And in this proposal, I had him look at all the roads that we did in 2020 and he, he bid each one of these roads as if they were being bid out. His projected number was 1.1 million. I think our number is uh, that we paid with this year was $530,000. So that's how much we saved the city. This year we did 13 roads. You know, when I was foreman, you know, we were doing 20, 25, 18 roads a year. I think what we need to do is get to a point where we're doing these just if the, if the number is 10 roads then we can establish you know priority of importance when it comes to water sewer um the storm water things that anthony has to do other than paving you know panel grinding is a big thing we could do to prolong um, preservation to the roadways crack sealing patching uh things like that very cheap to do the dirt patcher is one of our you know um material and time is the cheapest thing that we could put out the gallons that we put out is cheap. The stone that we put out is cheap. And that's a great way to get something out, you know, more bang for our buck. It goes a long way. So I'm telling you guys all this, just so when we go into this and we start talking about that number, um, you know, we were going off of 2019's budget numbers 
That's why that five what was it five twenty five that we had on there five fifty, whatever that number was. You know, normally I would I, I let you guys fill that that blank in and you tell me what we're going to pave with. I'm just reiterating to you guys that we really need to feel comfortable in a number that we're going to pick and go with that number, knowing that we have other things that we have to get to throughout the year and we have a short window to get those things accomplished. So. With that being said, if you guys got any questions, I'll answer on that before we dive into the budget. Mr. Chairman, uh, the question I had would be just last year out of the planned roads repaired, what percentage of that was completed? Would you say all of it was done or how short did we fall because of lack of labor and roads? All the roads? Yeah. We, roads had a, we did them all. We did them all. Okay. So we, I guess my point was we didn't give you too much last year. No. Okay. No. But what? Well, I guess what I'm saying is like right now we finished in October. Brian still has all the, um, from the water breaks or water leaks, all the, all the concrete we have to do or asphalt repair, landscaping. Um, you know, Anthony's got his whole panel grinding list. The plant's closed by uh, no, no Thanksgiving, just around there. So that, that window shrinks, you know, when you have other roads out there that can use panel grinding um, to go do a 24 or 48 inch, um, you know, cut on that road. And then you go ahead and pave that or patch that and crack seal it that road's now prolonged and you don't have that big dip when you're driving. So those things matter. That's what I'm getting at. But you know, um, I'm not saying that the, the, I'm just saying if we pick a number, like say it's 10 or 13, whatever that road's going to be, I just want to make sure that when we're done, because once we're done with that, you know, then we're hauling dirt, there's other things that we're doing. And then we have to flip and get everything ready for winter. So like I said, everything, there's a season for everything we do. And I just feel like once we start getting into this high number of roads we're paving, you know, you don't want to sacrifice uh, quantity for qual or, you know, quality for quantity. Right. So that's what I'm basically getting at. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page when we say that this number is going to have to be what it's going to be. We feel comfortable with that number and still feel like we're going to accomplish all the other goals that we have set for flooding and all that other things. So just so everybody's aware. Thank so, you. All right. So does that mean, go uh, Monty, you paved 13 roads this year. Mm -hmm. 12, I think. 12. 12. 12. Give us an example of what you didn't do uh, because you were doing all that work. Well, um, patching. You know, when you patch, you normally have two flaggers, uh, four or five guys on that crew. Um, when you panel grind, you have a guy in the skidster, you got a guy in the sweeper. So that's probably you're looking at the eight to nine to 10 guy crew. Um, crack sealing, it's a five guy crew, especially if they have to have flaggers, um, you know, sweeping. Those are the types of things, not including all Brian. What do, you, what do you have, Brian? Concrete 20, work. 30 yards of concrete that still has to be done, a bunch of landscaping, you know, probably two weeks worth of landscaping. It's, it's usually the, the small things that suffer. You know, we, we get all our big jobs done. We prioritize all this big stuff. We get all the roads done. It's, it's like Brian just said, it's, it's the little things. And then, you get a very small one that you try to squeeze all that in, along with Ray's stuff. So this year, I, Monty brought up the number 10, and I brought that up to him because by August, I had 10 roads paved. And if we can finish sometime in that time of year and give us end of August, September, October to get more stuff done, that's, that's kind of where that number 10 came from. But I mean, that can vary. I can have 12 roads that are easy to do, and I could be done with 12. Time, it just if we finish that list by August and you get into a panel grinding season, you know, you can go in a lot of these roads, Lorraine Road over in front of the Palace Place, all those little sections, just throwing it as an example, you know, we can go panel grind long, long sections and get them roads, you know, somewhat presentable. <clears throat> that's going to last a little bit longer and we could prolong the life of that road rather than going from a zero to 10 and now we're paving that road. That's why we say if, if you know, Paving has its plates, it's a tool in the toolbox, but so does crack sailing and patching and panel grinding. They all have their place as well, you know. Um, so I like I said, that's just to answer your question, there's other things that that sit. You know, we have a lot of minor ditches, roadside ditching, mowing, um, not to mention all the parcels. Now all the ditching that we're doing because we're clearing the right of way that goes on a mobile schedule. You know, Ray has to pro, you know, get that into the now we're doing um, the, the oops tickets. So that's usually one or two guys that are chasing those down. Um, when we fall behind on that because of whatever we're doing, we try to put two or three guys to catch us back up and you get shut off from the water department. You know, any number we come up with, we're going to work with it and prioritize it and, and fit it in. I just want to make sure that it's a number that's comfortable with everybody so that we're not saying, hey, next year, let's go 16 roads, next year, 17 roads. You know, we continue to grow. 
you know, and, and we know we have a lot of concrete infrastructure out there. And if we're not crack sailing the concrete infrastructure, you know, we're going to be hurting 10 years from now. So John, would you say with the manpower you have, you're kind of maxed out without making things suffer more? Is that kind of what we're saying here? If we're, if we're paving, you're not doing all those other things, okay. you know, and that's the reality of it. You know, the year we did 750,000 or 766,000 in paving, we did 25 roads, which caught us up. Our grades for our roads were over 85%. And I think over this last year, we fixed all the roads that were in the red. So, you know, our number for, for our grading for our roads, in my opinion, is exceptional. You know what I mean? There's not too many roads you're going to drive down that you're going to see a lot of uh, wear and tear. Um, you know, you're going to have, we live in Ohio, you're going to have frosting, you're going to have heaving, you're going to have, you know, potholes pop and all that type of stuff. That's just general maintenance, but a long-term plan so that we can budget for, what we're doing, set up the way we're going to do it, and then prioritize within the department for all the other priorities, I think is a bigger scale, especially when we look at a lot of things that we have to do in the stormwater. Uh, and it's a lot. So when we're talking about panel grinding, because I don't know. Sure. I mean, I understand we were talking about crack seal and mm -hmm. paving and stuff. What kind of time commitment? Like, what's the process? Like, what goes uh, into it? Depending on uh, what you're trying to do in a day. So if you did, um, let's just use Stony Ridge, that curve, for example. We went down there in a day, and I think we did from just before the curve um, almost to Avalon, where that, that guy goes down in a skidster. You can cut a two-inch reveal. It drops down two inches. Um, that guy keeps going with another guy guiding them, and then you'll have the sweeper come and clean up all the mess, and then your paved guys come behind them, tack, and, and uh, resurface. Okay. Um, that's a temporary fix, but it's a long-lasting, it's a more permanent repair than just a patch. Right. Okay. So, like I said, that getting those other little type of things done increases our road value even more. So How many streets did we do that last year too, the panel grinding? Um, not very many. Okay. You know, Crack Seal has been, um, even when uh, Mayor was president of council, you know, he used to call me weekly, why are we not Crack Seal? Why are we Crack Seal? And I would reiterate to him, like, look, you know, we put a lot of time, you have 22 to 25 people paving it. That's your trucks, that's your tar kettle, that's your guys on your paver, that's your guys rolling, that's your flaggers. That's a big operation. And I think we do a better job than some of the contractors. Um, maybe because we live here. I don't know if that's the, the reason why you put a little more pride in your work. But I'm just trying to paint the picture that we have a lot of areas that we need to touch up that's been neglected for a long time. Um, paving is definitely a good tool in the toolbox that we can do. When we said we needed in pavers because it's 20 years old, it's not magically going to be like, okay, now we're going to be able to bang out 50 roads. You know, we have, you know, when you talk about quality and quantity, when you, your paver gets old, your streets gets worn out, your gears and your augers and that type of thing slows productivity down. Your street doesn't put the same mat down. Um, those things matter. You know what I mean? Then your roller guys are trying to fight to try to make the road look better than what it should. You get a newer paver with a thicker street. Everything now is um, electric. So the screws that we're going with, you guys have guys that are physically, manually cranking the screws. You know, that's ancient. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now you're pushing buttons and it's telling you your thickness. It's telling you the auger is requiring the material. That's going to make us more faster and efficient. You know what I mean? So if we get to that, that's, that's the number reason we need the paper. It is going to make us more faster, more efficient. But ultimately, I just want to make sure everyone understands that just because we get a new paper, we're not going to be popping out 30 rows. You know what I mean? Um, that's that's all I'm trying to say. Well, I know we're going to get there when we talk about personnel, but how many openings do you have right now um, for the, the road construction? We just uh, lost two guys, um, so we'll be filling those two guys. Um, and then from that, we prioritize within uh, on a daily basis, uh, depending. I mean, 7 o'clock, these guys usually get here at 6.30. Um, they usually have job, jobs done by 6.50. And... By 7.30, you can get a phone call, a water break, or a sewer uh, sinkhole or something that changes the entire day. So we live on dirt wall. You know, so that's why I say, you know, if we have to pull people to go do the water break, now that crew that could have been cracks in or doing something else is now doing the water work. Um, and this is an everyday thing with us, and we're used to it. So um, we try to prioritize the best we can, but we get hit with things all the time where someone calls or Bruce will call and say, hey, I got something going on in a ditch back here. We go take a look at it, and now it's a, a big priority because the tree's blocking the, the ditch. We know we got inclement weather coming in. These are all the types of things that throw a swing in an everyday thing. Um, you know, I'm not trying to, to, to ramble on about this too much. I'm just trying to paint a picture so you guys understand when we get to the, the point of that. 
Let me jump in about the personnel, though. You know, Monty mentioned that he's lost two guys recently in that process, unfortunately, uh, can take a really long time for it to work itself out. The way the union process works is those employees, you know, have the right to go to arbitration once the decision is made to terminate. And that's the two instances that he's talking about recently. Those employees have the right to go to arbitration. And if they choose to go down that route, we can't replace those employees until that process is over. And right now that process is taking months and months and months. So uh, we might have those positions open for six months before they can be filled. Because if you lose at arbitration and they say that that person should have their job back, you can't just, you know, now add an extra person into the mix. Do we have anybody scheduled this year to retire? Uh, potentially, we have one guy. Okay. So, excuse me, the, the two losses that you have are basically at the city's request rather than at their own uh, doing what you're saying. Both, I guess you could say. Demand. Yeah, not request. <laughs> <laughs> Poor choice of words. <laughs> you guys got anything, any questions on that? Um, I guess the question I would have is in a perfect world, uh, you could, you, what you're saying is you could use more personnel. Well, we also live in reality. We, are, we also know what's going on in the world. We know, we know we can prioritize with what we have. That's why I'm saying if we can't increase the manpower, then we need to think outside the box. Be smarter with what we have and the resources we have and utilize that. That's what I'm saying. I know that um, meeting with Jeff and the mayor in April, I know how tight we are with money. I know that um, we're going on 2019's budget. Normally I'm increasing everything. Um, we've, we've pretty much had the same number of people since I started. We haven't gained really anybody. I think we added two people because of the oops um, ticket request, and that was maybe two or three years, a couple of years, yeah. So, like I said, whatever we're, we have manpower-wise, we're going to fit it in. I'm just saying if we know we can't add manpower, then we have to be wise with what we're doing and we're, and we're putting on the plate as far as paving. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Further questions on the subject? You want to go to the equipment list first? Okay. So on these uh, the equipment schedule under the service department, we started uh, a lease program where we had um, we had like a 20 year backhoe. We had a couple um, old draughts. We had an excavator, a couple of things that we were putting a lot of money into. And one of the ways that we got into this municipal lease was, um, I think we tried it the first time with four pieces of equipment. Um, I think we ended up doing like 10 miles of ditching um, with that. And then we ended up getting a trading cost, which was a $40,000 difference, correct April? Um, it was 40,000 we saved, so we added another piece of equipment by going into another municipal lease, which was the 210, which you guys seen over at St. Pete's doing all that work. Um, so that's what that those top ones are. That's your backhoe, that's your loader. That's where we load our trucks for salt and for mud and all that stuff, stone. Um, the 2140s, the 255s, your 210 and your 140 are all basically machines that we either have on water breaks or they're in major minor ditches. Uh, the sweeper is a four-year lease. Um, that's something that uh, comes in handy when, like I said, we do panel grinding or we do paving, just a general maintenance of cleaning the city. We keep that on a rotating uh, schedule. The Han roller, those were... Um, Excuse me, John. Sure. Are you working from this? I was just going right down the list. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is for this year. I'll get to that when we get down okay. to it. Thank you, though. Um, about three or four page back on the streets. It's the equipment schedule that's in the binder. Okay, thank you. The Hom Rollers uh, is a piece of equipment we use for patching and for paving. Um, the two 870 Bobcats were, one of those are basically used for our forestry. Um, we have a forestry cutter on there. That's where we go and we usually cut like um, whatever the fecon breaks up, this machine goes in and grinds it up to a finer chip. 
um, or if it's a heavy wooded area, that'll go and it'll cut everything down so the, the excavator can get to the points of uh, the right of way. Um, the second uh, Bobcat 870 is what we use for like our, we'll put a brush hog attachment on there or some kind of flail cutter to go a um, little bit thicker, tough grass. It's not, it's not a finished mower by any means. Um, the 2019 Cabelco, the 55 excavator is what Brian uses for his water sewer um, job. Um, the paver is on the first slide of your equipment schedule list. Under this, this uh, we did a lot of research on these. This 8530 has uh, the seats cantilever. So when you sit on the old one, you're sitting facing forward and you have to lean the whole time to see your crown of the road. This cantilever's out, so you're sitting over top of your crown and you can actually see ahead of where the trucks are and the guiders pointing you. Um, not only that, everything on it's you know newer technology, the street, the, the, the slope's much heavier, the street's thicker, so it's gonna produce a better product. Um, how many papers do we have right now? Just just one. Just the one? Yeah. Yeah, I think we put uh, we usually put uh, 10 to you know 20, 30 grand in it. Um, we'll put it a line item in there for budgetary repairs. You know, most of the thing it's all it's all older gears and hydraulics, so it's it's not much all the time, but like fly bars, your chains, stuff of that nature is just kind of what you fix on that. Um, the 2021 crew cab pickup is going to replace truck E, um, which is the next one on the slide. And then uh, the 2021 single axle dump truck plow will replace truck 29. We have um, that list that, that Rick had given you guys for the, the fleet that we have. When we go to do these, um, to talk about trading something in or see if we can flip it from a salt truck to remove the V-box and, and the plow attachments and use it for a mud truck to prolong the life of that truck, we normally do that. So if we ask for a new truck, it's, it could be because that one, what was the truck that we got rid of that was in bad shape? That 29, 29, the whole 29. So when we do that, we try to take it out of the fleet and put it into um, hauling dirt or something we can utilize it for before we fully get rid of that truck. We will use it till we can't use it anymore, till Rick deems it unsafe, and then at that point we get rid of it. But um, we try to prioritize these as, as years we got them, and then we look at money that we can get upon trade-in or, um, you know, the life of that truck, where we're at with um, And that is the F-150 dump truck, or 550, I'm sorry, is replacing 57 and 58. Uh, we bought these, what were they, 2008s, 2008s, and both of those trucks, um, we have three of them that we bought that year. It's just, we already had to literally remove the entire cab of this truck, and it was almost a one-month fix on both of the trucks we had, and we have a third. We don't want to get into that, so we're trying to get some money for it and get out of those, get into something different. Um, the 2021 crew cab pickup is going to replace truck nine. And that is, it's the same as the, the previous slide, same exact truck. Uh, the catwalk for our cleaning of our trucks. So when we load, our trucks go into a lower pit and our loader comes and loads into the top of those trucks and you get these big um, balls and you get sleet, rain, snow build up on that, that snow. So we have to go up and we have to clean off those salt balls. Um, and they, they're standing on basically steel that's wet. So it's, it's basically unsafe. So we're trying to get something that we can go up there, harness them off, they can clean them off real quick, get back on the catwalk, get back down. It's more of a safety preventive so someone doesn't get hurt. Uh, and that's something you usually have to do every time it snows, just clean the top of that off. So when you go to load the next batch, you're not dumping it over the side or it's ending up in the pit, so. Um, the epoxy flooring for the service garage. So right now we have no coating on the floor between the five bays that all the mechanics work in. So every time a truck's pulled in, or air compressors going off, or the air brake chambers are blowing, all the dirt that's on the floor, you can sweep it as much as you want. It's still gonna blow, all this dust goes in the air. So we're trying to get some, some type of coating. Um, we're gonna look in, this was the cost that you brought in. We're gonna try to find it something a little cheaper just to get us through. I know the plan's not for us to be there for long, but we're just looking for some type of coating on that floor that could be a little bit more easily cleaned and taken care of. Um, the crack sealer, I believe, is a 2010. Um, 
this one right now, we've already had, I've had several different companies come out and try to give us, we have low hours on that crack sealer and they're not really offering us much for that crack sealer. So we're trying to get out of it to get into a um, somewhat of a bigger unit to get back out. That's what we're doing that one for. The bat wing mower is uh, an attachment. You can go on. This attachment is what we use to cut the highway, all of our detention and retentions. Um, a lot of the areas that we can get alongside, like the power lines, stuff like that. This is what we'll take this out with and cut. Um, the one we have is is pretty beat up, so this is just a replace something that's old and we're pouring money into. Um, the trailer that we have right now, we have one that we got. Um, we traded French Creek a couple years back, and we've had, but the the way the the ramps are on it does not serve a purpose for kind of what we need. So we're gonna trade that in and get this so that our skidsters, when we wanna go take it to a job to flail cut or um, get out ahead of the forestry cutter, we'll load it onto this trailer and then it'll go out. Um, the next one is the offset dish bank mower. That offset dish bank mower, so you have your roadside mower that you guys see the big tractor, it's got the big arm that comes down. It's got counterweight on this side of the tractor so he can reach as far as he can to cut the outside of the bank. The inside ditch mower comes behind him and cuts what's inside so that tractor doesn't have to keep backing up going down Jaycox or Stony or Bender or any of those types of roads. Um, so that would be the purpose of that. We've never owned one and I think that with all the ditches that we have that are open that we know we're not gonna close because they hold more volume, that would be wise to get this attachment. Um, the sewer camera with accessories, I'll let Brian dive into that and all the money we poured into the one we have. So the sewer camera and model camera we have right now are out basically every day in the storms and the sanitary systems. The one we have now is seven years old or so. And this year alone, we've put about 20 grand into repairs for that camera. It's past its life, it's past its use. The new system mounts up to our existing truck and computer and all that. So what we're looking at doing is replacing the actual crawler, the lateral launch, which allows us to go down the sanitary sewers or storm sewers and look up in people's laterals to see if they have blockages when they call. Um, so that's what we're looking at that. It's just, it's, it's way past its life by now. And we're just pouring money into it. Does that price tag include like any kind of software or anything like It's an upgrade on the software that we already have. The truck already has everything in it. This new camera is basically faster. Uh, it's got better optics on it. It has an extra 300 feet of cable, so it allows us to go farther down the line at one shot. Um, instead of going every manhole, we can go almost two full manholes in between and be able to look at it. The lateral launch on it, um, our old one, after about 30 inches of rate, right when you have to raise up in a 30 inch pipe to loot the camera out, uh, it's not strong enough, it falls over. This one will do up to a 72 inch pipe, which we don't have in the city, but it will do up to a 72 inch pipe so that we could actually, you know, if we got into some large storm that had a tie into it, we could actually see it. They upgraded the tires on it, the way they're connected, they upgraded the drive system on it. It's just a way better system. But like I said, ours is about seven years old and that's about as long as the sewer camera last for the environment that it's in all the time. Out of this last year, how many days would you say that the current camera was down or out of service? A lot. Several months. Every time we take the camera in, it's about $1,000 for repair. <coughs> um, sometimes it's in for two days, other times it's in for two or three weeks. It just depends on what the issue is. In set, it could be, like you said, Martin, it could be um, the software, it could be an issue with the uh, cable itself. You know, you're going around all those, when you're coming down that thing, this thing comes up into the lateral and it projects out into the lateral. So this thing's anchoring. You know, if that is too tight of a curve or you go into some kind of an S in there or a T-trap and you pull that cable too fast, it, it will break that cable and it's fiber, so it's going to have to replace it. Nothing, nothing on that's cheap. Nothing on the sewer back's cheap. So what do we do right now when it does go down? Do we borrow from another city? We have, a, we have a real push cam that we'll use. And if we can't get into a lateral, we'll tell them no. Um, the plan was to replace what we have on the older one 
and keep it as a backup right. and make this the primary and that would be the secondary to get us through whatever we had. To so do. when this one, if this one went down, we would have our older one as a backup. It's all the same connections. It all fits the set together the same. They all work together. This is just a completely upgraded model. The uh, old one would fit with the software of the new one too? It's all compatible. It's all the same company. It's all the same software. The software we have now will run the new one. It, the new one just allows us to access some features in the camera and recording easier. So since we're talking about water sewer, we um, for 2022, we had put out there just so to drop the seat for you guys to plan it. Um, the agitator for the water tower, Brian put $100,000 in there for this mark, but he's did research and it's nowhere near that. I think it's like 25 grand. 33 grand for the actual unit and to install it's like another 20 grand or something like that so i think we're going to be under 50 grand when it comes down to it and with this one here there is no nothing that goes in the actual water tower itself it's all air driven oil is air compressor so there's nothing that actually goes inside the water tower it's all stationed outside of the tap and i said 100,000 has been listed there for that's because we weren't sure exactly what the price was going to be because I couldn't get any response from the company. Finally got back from them, and it's going to be about 25 for the unit. Then you're going to have installation and uh, running the 220 line. So I think we're going to come in well under the 50,000 when it actually comes down to it. Thank you. General, what kind of condition is our uh, water tower actually in at this point? Excellent. What this does is going to increase the motion inside the tower by putting the air bubble in there. It starts out as just a one inch, three quarter inch tap, puts, puts some air in. By the time it gets to the top, or the top of the water tower, it's a four foot bubble and it will turn over all the water, mix all the water in our water tower in about 15 minutes. Does that increase quality? It's gonna increase your water quality, the taste of odor complaints, things like that. It's, it's strictly for making the water better for the residents. There's nothing nothing else for this except for to keep it mixed. So the transit van, um, we are gonna be replacing uh, W15. Joe Smith, who kind of works for our department and our utilities, uh, handles all the meter jobs, um, locates turn-ons, turn-offs, uh, things of that nature. We need a van that's like this with all these um, cabinets in the back for all the fittings he has for the the meters, the badger stuff, plus all the shutoffs, the keys, and all the stuff we need. So this one's going to have to be outfitted for exactly what he does, so that when he pulls up to a job, we don't hear, "Hey, I don't have this in the van; it's in another van, or we have it in the barn at the shop." You know, this will make it a little more efficient. That van's used on a regular daily basis. Every day. Okay. Uh, six hydrant backflow devices. Not right now. We, have we, six. we just got six new ones. We're replacing all the one inch, two inch, three inch, getting rid of all the old ones that cannot be tested anymore and they're outdated and not working properly. We've got six in this year. We want to get six more next year, and then that's going to cover us for probably 10 years before we have to do this again. And this is and it's a standard size. You can explain to them what it's used for. So all the contractors in the city that want to use water have to come get a hydrant meter so that it's got backflow prevention so that it cannot feed anything from their machines or trucks or tanks back into our water system. Plus it's got the meet the uh, <coughs> meter built into it with a kickstand. So it takes the weight off of the hydrant itself and allows us to track any water that goes through there. Right now there's one inch ones, two inch ones, three inch, you know, different sizes throughout the city that just don't work. We're standardizing them all to the two and a half nozzle. If they want to use a one inch hose, they can uh, supply a fitting for the end of that on their end, but it's all going to be standard, same sizes, all interchangeable. Um, and Brian, they actually pay for the use of these too, right? They do have to put a $1,500 deposit on, which is going to have to be raised to probably $2,000 or $2,300. Usually it's the cost of the replacement plus a little bit in case it gets damaged on the field. You guys got any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, 2022 uh, that we pushed out this single axle dump truck. That's going to replace 
addition for the water. Addition for him. So that's not outfitted for um, snow plowing. It's just the dump truck for water breaks, down, mud hauling, all that type of stuff. Um, the box truck that we currently have for the water breaks is um, when we got that, I don't know, years back. It's the, the body's too short. So the ladders, the keys, the piping that we have to take down there, we have to outfit it in that truck. So when we get down there, we have all the saddles and everything with us. This is just to make it um, more current. How big is that box truck? Like how long? Uh, the one we currently have? 15. 15, 15 foot. We want to get like a 21, 24 footer. A stick of pipe is 20 foot long. Yeah. Okay. And this is for 2022, though, for both these items. So. Yeah. Uh, the 40 inch flow mower. So you guys have seen the, have you guys seen the flow mower out working? Kind of like the Pecan, but it's a little smaller. You have not seen it? It's kind of, it's got a rotary that's on the end of the, it's basically like a mower that's built into a head and it goes and does the smaller ditches, minor ditches, roadsides with that basically. So you don't have to go and cut and brush hog all that type of stuff. Um, and that's for the 55 that we put into the smaller ditches. Um, the FECON, the rake and the ripper tooth is because we added a second 140 that um, will do the same thing that the other one does. This FECON basically goes down and clears all right away that we have. And then if we run into like a shale or sandstone, we put that ripper tooth on there like we did St. Pete's. And I think we dropped that water. What was it, Ray? Oh, almost. It was over a foot. Almost so we dropped inches. the water almost a foot there through the course of St. Pete's Gym, just behind uh, the office there to the north. Um, because we couldn't get the fall before because of the sandstone. The, the reason why we're, the process that we're using right now is that FECON, once it's on there because of the valves and the hydraulics, it's, it's, it's kind of a pain to take off, put back on, take off, put back on. So it would be easier for that guy to finish his job and then switch from that FECON back to his rake, clean up his mess, then switch, put his bucket on. And instead of having him come in, FECON, go to another ditch, and then had somebody else come in, clean up his mess, just basically keep that machine in that ditch until completion. That way we can have the other machine in a complete different ditch, just basically going through there. Yeah, anytime you FECON, it goes everywhere. And all that chips are in the ditch. So if you know that you have uh, inclement weather coming, you have to get all that stuff raked out of the ditch or it's going to go and plug up in a culvert and then we're going to be fighting that with a jet or trying to figure out a way to get it out of there. So that's the reason we do it in that order. You pecan, you rake it, then you clean it, then you shave it in that order. Um, that's pretty much, we. that's all we have on this equipment list. You guys got any questions on any of it? GIS was on there, but that's a renewal for something we already have that's software. The last picture you guys see on this is a tremble unit that we use. Um, Ray and another gentleman goes out and they'll put all the locates for um, like our hydrants, our watch valves, all that stuff. We put it on a GIS layer and we load it up into our master file, which is our. Um, this is something that we're going to plan on doing for all the streets we do, all the signs we have. Pretty much keep a running inventory and you know, keep a better track of everything. All right. Monty? Yeah. How, how often are you finding surprises uh, as far as water sewer? Didn't know it was there? Or... Daily. <laughs> <laughs> what? There's I'm a, assuming they're being recorded now. We have some kind of whatever we, uh, some minutes. So, down. so what Ray's done is anytime that we go into an area where, um, you know, it's a sanitary that's running through a backyard or something like that, they'll take points every so often. And then when you click that layer, it'll pull up all the points he pulled. So then you'll see the WO, which is the work order on there. And you can click it and you'll see the picture or you'll see something that was um, a homeowner covered it up because they didn't want to see the manhole or they didn't tell us to bring the grade up or they didn't tell the developer to bring the grade up. We're finding ones that were buried for 10 years and we've been running 400 foot a line. We can be running 200 foot a line. And it's just something we encounter all the time, um, depending on where it's at. So. So basically these surprises are because homeowners and contractors don't necessarily tell you what they're doing. Well, back then, I don't think you really had, um, record keeping as well. Record keeping is a good, a good word. We, the software that he has to be able to go out there and within, uh, you know, a meter to tell you that this is exactly where the meter is or exactly where the hydrant is. 
um, I think it's sub foot that we're yeah. getting. So that's pretty accurate. And if we can do that with our signs, with our roads, with our ditches, um, and we have those types of meetings and you can run the reports off the same thing. It gives you a better view of all that type of stuff. Um, is there anything I'm forgetting there, Ray? No, I mean, mo most of the problems obviously is everything that's underground. It's, it's stuff that's hidden or that's, you know, behind the brush. Um, one of the projects we'll get into talking about was Frontier Park and there's, there's a gas building back there and there's gas lines that run under and there was multiple gas lines that the gas company had abandoned and then put new lines. Well, when they abandon them, they just leave them there. So you're kind of like trying to pick and choose which well can we lower the water level because you have two gas lines here that are running in conduit. So then, you know, I'm marking those and getting with the gas company and trying to figure out, well, which ones are live? Well, we don't know. We have to come out here and test them. So same with, it's, it's, it's same with the water breaks. Any through. water break that we have, Bill Tremble shoot that saddle so we'll know exactly where that repair was done, where the gas line is. It's all documented within that worker. So when you click and you get a picture of the whole, you see the line, you see the saddle, you see the storm line, you'll see the gas line, and it's a way to just document. So if you have a problem in that area, and we know that we don't have time to wait for the oops guy to show up to mark the gas, Brian already knows to get the sewer back down there, and they can start hydroing with water to get the ball rolling so that resident's not going And hopefully this will help us with infrastructure in the future, knowing that if you're looking at a mile, how many water breaks have been in that mile stretch, maybe it's time to just replace that entire water line instead of, you know, continuously putting Band-Aids on it. Any more questions, John? Um, just hide out. Are you gonna go through street? Yes. Yeah. Are we going line by line or am I just jumping the big thing? No, we wanna just go through the high dollar, the big changes. Okay. Big things that we've added into the budget. Okay. So starting off in the street construction M and R fund. We, the uh, big change we did this year, I think the previous two years, it was out of um, State Highway, correct, April? What was the other one? Salt? What line? Oh, Salt. Yeah, Salt was out of the two. Yeah, we switched these because the fund couldn't support it. Um, I think it was reversed last year. More money was coming out of the other. Um, so we moved it here to increase it. I think Salt this year was 71.54 or something like that, um, which is pretty consistent with what it was last year. Um, trying to go down here. Guardrails. Um, we have 28,000 that's left on here. I uh, wanted to talk about that for a minute. We added a bunch of new guardrails up on the highway. Um, Anthony was going through the city with the contractor we use, and he's probably going to do more this year. Um, but I think 50 here is pretty consistent. We added a new guardrail on their Nagel. We added a bunch on Marine Road. Uh, and on the highway so and that's the one that you'll never know the number because people hate guardrails <laughs> they don't tell you you go find it's mangled in the middle of the night so i do have a question sure if the if somebody hits a guardrail mm -hmm. and they're at the scene does the insurance company place so the guardrail the they, they do we get a police report we'll file that police report um we'll document it it'll go to april and go to the treasurer's office and they work out how that's going to be paid like normally if I like to say it's a hire or something like they hit, they'll fill out all of our time. So to call out the manpower, basically fuel material that all goes within that he goes to that and that's how we and do those get tagged normally? Unless it's some guy that doesn't have insurance or something like that. Just takes off. Yeah. yeah so well, okay. yeah. Uh, what area that you may want to look at as far as guard girls is concerned is Sugar Ridge on the western end of that area. <coughs> The owners constantly find the cards in their field. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I know one of the signs, arrow signs, were knocked down a few years ago. I don't think it's ever been put back up. Yeah, or we might have to look at that. That might need something different. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think we had one there. Did we not have one there? A guardrail? There's still a guardrail on the south side of the road. We took the guardrail down based on the See, accidents that were there and yeah, safety. So that down. was taken down by the city and you're talking about coming in from malaria? No, we do not want to put that back up. Okay. Just absolutely not. Yeah, we'll we'll check. We'll check with uh Freeman, Chief Freeman when we go down there. We normally coordinate that. I think we had a high amount of accidents there. Yeah. And I think the last car flipped over that guardrail and ended up in the field upside down. That's why we removed it and we moved it just to the uh, west. So 
Right now, you've got the chevrons that are going around there, and they go out into the field. Last time before they flip yeah. over, and we were last time I knew one or two were missing. Pardon me? The last time I knew one or two were missing. Well, we should, chevrons. If we can't put a guardrail there, Bruce, maybe look at something like a flashing something. curve ahead or something that'll draw attention to them. Okay. We'll look at we'll look into it. My understanding is it usually happens late at night. They're drunk. Yeah, I was going to say it. Depends on how soft <laughs> they tell you how it is. He's trying to say it tonight. Now that the bars are closed, yeah. we're good. <laughs> <laughs> no, that one happens at 11 o'clock. <laughs> so uh, moving down, um, one of the other funds that's really not, you really don't, you can't predict is our city garage fund. A lot of what Rick does um, they try to do a lot of things in-house, such as fabricating or, or painting or something like that. But a lot of things that we can't predict is breakdowns. So that's why if you see April come in here and she's asking for more money. It's because um, that has to be replenished. Um, we can't predict breakdowns. Um, moving down to the equipment rental. This, this was moved, correct, April, from street levy to over here. So this $100,000, which is normally in street levy, this is uh, the brother and sister, usually that paving money and this um, money go hand in hand. We can, we can interchange those, but since this is under a five year, she moved it here and the same thing can apply under this. That's why it's here. So. What type of equipment would be rented? That's um, $100,000. Well, this, this is when we get like, um, like trucks, uh, the mill that we rent from them. Um, uh, sometimes it could be a bigger roller if you're doing like a, um, a bigger job you need a little more compaction it all depends but normally that uh, that goes for mostly the mill so or if you're getting trucks and part of the plan was to sub out more trucking so that we could free up more manpower to do the other things um, so when we get into talking about the price of the roads and um, the equipment rental we take the total number we see how many trucks that we can run out for the mill and for the paved job, free up that manpower to go do the things that we were talking about. That's one of the ideas that we talked about last year. Um, but the, the problem is you get your list out now, we sit down, we talk about it. Either A, that road has deteriorated because of the winter and has jumped up the list that you didn't plan on, or you get to the point where you're looking for um, roads that need to be paved in, in a different type of order, and then you end up having to go back and uh, you, then the cost comes out, $12 it jumped from the previous year. I wasn't anticipating a $12 jump. So now a road that you are trying to go three inches on, you're cutting into two, um, which is still above ODOT spec, but those types of things matter. You know what I mean? So when we look at the roads, that's why I say you can, you can want to do a two inch base with a two inch lift uh, for the surface. And then if you have those 13 roads, you say, hey, we have to get these 13 roads done. Then we look at modifying either the material or the depth that we're putting down to make it work. So thank you. Why don't you explain the hundred thousand is actually bid out so you know what the cost of the equipment is? Yeah, we get a we bid out that every year for the equipment rental. Normally, when Jeremy gives us that, that includes anything you can think of road related. That's crack seal. That's um, um, bow magging. Um, what's it called? Um, Oh, uh, pulverized, pulverizing, um, like a road, like ben, uh, Bagley road. You know, when we spec that road, when we originally did it, we spec that road and we knew that the cost was going to be a high dollar. If you go in and do a road like Bagley, you need to, uh, core sample, take that sample, which we would then pulverize that road, take everything that's in the top and we put it into the base. They liquefy it let it sit for a week or two, traffic travels on it, beats it in, and we give it a good roll with a high pack uh, roller. And then we come back, we add a base, we add a top. Now that road strengthened and you won't see all that cracking or the shifting moving on the top. Um, when you see a, a 12 ton a truck coming down that road fully loaded with concrete after we paved it, we already knew that that was gonna be a temporary fix. Um, much like uh, Bender Road. Bender Road was holding up well, considering there was an old farm field and we put layers of tar and chip over it. Now, if you look five years from now and it's having the same problems, you go through the same process, pulverize, liquefy, then you add that and it strengthens your road. So, next <clears throat> up. Um, Just so you're aware, I have got, I've received quite a few compliments on Bender Road. 
I hope it wasn't from the first time we tried to scratch it. <laughs> <laughs> the complaints I get about Bender Road are the one, the car portion that's in the whole area. Yeah. So the equipment leasing, the equipment outlay, the next two high dollars, that would be for anything that we're going forward with uh, as far as purchasing for 2021. Um, uh, state Highway Fund, that's where the second uh, portion of the road salt comes from, at 120000 Second one. So we proportioned that differently because there was a decrease. What supports that fund is excise tax and a portion of the permissive. And we seen a decrease in excise tax. So that's why we proportioned it differently. So motor vehicle. Um, yeah, the motor vehicle license tax. We moved the street paint from street levy, correct, April, to this fund. So the street paint, where we used to do it, we only paid for like a five thousand dollar rental of equipment, and then we pay like twenty five grand for the paint. But trying to do all the painting in the city on top of everything else, and then doing all the arrows and the crosswalks, um, this company that comes in, you know, you're, it's guaranteed work. If they mess something up or they can't get to it, then it's on them. And this is something that saved us a lot of time this year. To not have to come out and spend two or three weeks at night painting crosswalks and roads and intersections. So it was definitely worth it. Yeah. I just want to back up real quick for one second. Um, I know we went by salt. How are we doing on salt as far as supplies goes? We have, uh, April asked me to look at this um, the other day. We have probably close to, it's a guesstimate, our barn holds about 3,000 tons, maybe a shade over that. And I want to say we're three quarters full, maybe a little more than that. So I want to say maybe. 2,500 to 2,800, somewhere in there, tons is full. Um, so you're starting with almost a full barn. Um, and do we expect to get another delivery soon over the winter, or how does that work? We, well, we won't put another uh, delivery in until we get maybe into the middle of that. We have a, a marker in there, and once we get to that marker, then I'll order another 1,500 tons. That'll put us back at a full barn, then you'll have another 25 to 3,000 tons to get you through the winter. Um, the last two years that we haven't exercised our entire 100%. We've, we've been at 90% of that budget and we've stayed there and we've saved money in the, in the long run. Adding the liquid to the trucks, the liquid's 79 cents a gallon um, and you're not putting down as much salt is a huge savings. Uh, that's probably why we're not going through the salt that we were going through back then because you turn the switch on and turn the rate up and you just go. You know, now it's all um, electronic. So you're setting your rate, you're setting your um, auger, and then you're setting that feed to match what the rate's coming out. So the spray's hitting that. So anytime we get out and we pre-wet or we're um, hitting those roads right when we get the call. Before I took over, we were waiting for PD to contact us. We've changed that. If we know storm's coming, I'm, I don't need them to tell me that snow's coming when we can all see it's a big storm coming. I'll contact Brian and Anthony, whoever's on that call. They'll get out ahead of the storm and they'll pre-wet all the bridges, all the curbs, all the hills. That buys us time. So if you know you got a lot of weather coming, that's something that you don't have to hit right away and you can get to the other mains. Um, make it through all of them and you come back to where you basically started. So there's never a time where we have too much salt and we're looking for a place to store. Not the last two years. We've been, the last seven, eight years, we've been um, lucky. We've had mild winters. You know, you're getting these sleet and water or freezing rains. We're not getting high uh, accumulations of snow like we were getting. So you are going through some salt totals, but I think with the addition to the, I think we have 10 or 11 trucks now with the other two, I think we have 12 um, trucks outfitted with uh, liquid. So that's a 13, sorry. That's, that's, so your highway, all your major roads in the city, almost every one of them are covered under liquid. So that's a huge savings. And at what point do we decide to switch over to turn the trucks into plows and to have them be able to spread salt? As soon as we're done paving, which is normally in November, this okay. is the first year that I can remember since I took over foreman to this that we've gotten done in October or before October. Uh, normally we're paving in November with flashlights on a job, you know, because you get to start quicker. Um, so we started hauling dirt. We're trying to get rid of all the dirt in the back of our shop. Um, once we get, you know, we bit into that a little bit. Now we're, well, I think we have what, eight, nine trucks ready, Rick, something like that for uh, seven, seven, right seven trucks. We have one auger done. Um, the, the good thing we did a while back, Rick started looking into, we were looking at um, V-Box hoists 
and stuff like that. So we ended up finding something that we can pull the V-Box out, the legs drop. And then once you lift the bed up, it slides out and it just stands on its own. So then we can flip those trucks and use them as needed to haul or to do what we got to do. And then when the snow's coming, you back back in, you clean it out. It basically loads itself and you lock it. So it's the technology's really catching up and it's, it's a lot better than what we used to have to where you had to carousel trucks and physically lift them up, take them out, set them on blocks. And then, you know, so right, thank you. Any questions on that? Good. Repaid was previously paid for out of the MR fund, 210. Uh, street paving materials. So, this $550,000, um, I think it's a good number myself. I don't know what you guys feel. I'm sure if Dennis was here, he's going to tell me I'll speak for him. He's going to tell me to pay a million dollars here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, like I said, you know, there's, I, I I just want everyone to understand that even when you come to certain roads, you know, I was talking to the mayor the other day and one of the things he alluded to was, you know, you never know what you're going to get when you take the top cover of that road off, how bad the road is until you actually see what's underneath. Um, and when you get into that, you're looking at high dollar concrete repairs, curb repairs, catch basin repairs, and then you're getting into the portion where you're actually paving something that you might have had planned for two inches then you take a look and you say hey we can put a base and a top on this increase this road by 30 40 000 and make it a better road those are things you can look into i just want to make sure that if we put 10 roads and we're not at that 550 or 600 thousand dollar threshold that you guys are like, oh yeah, we can go do another four roads you know, we just we got to keep the other side of everything else in mind would you say with that budget, uh, John, we'd be doing about the, around the same amount of paving? I'm not talking about rows, but like volume, because I know some rows take more than others. It, it all depends on things. what the roads are. You know, if you're doing, for example, I think um, we, if we're going to do some roads by your house, like all those side streets, those are mill, that's what we call mill and fill. That you're showing up, there's really no basins there. You're basically milling, you're coming back, you're tacking, you're paving. That's something that keeps us moving. If you go into a road like anywhere by, the north side of town that's got asphalt overlays. Paul is a, good example. Paul is a perfect example. You know, you, you, I actually brought Dennis down there to show Dennis. And I told him, you know, like this, when you look at a road like this and you see minimal cracking on the top and you peel it off, the base is in terrible condition. You know, we paved that road knowing that it's going to be added to a bucket list somewhere in the future to have to be a full depth. Uh, that's going to be a full reconstruction job, start to finish all new concrete. Or if you could do concrete curb and an asphalt middle. But when you when we do these things and you know the roads that's coming up your um, your West Points, your fern trees, all those type of roads, we know what the base looks like. We don't need a core sample to see it. Um, and like I said, how much money are you going to put into a road that you already know is bad on the base? You're going to put 50 grand of concrete in that road, knowing you know it needs uh, probably a good 150 thousand dollars in concrete or more to do the whole road right. So those are things that you have to weigh when you figure out that list. You know, there's there's no there's no knowing until you actually peel that road off. Sure. I know there was a, a year when we did Olive Walls Cornell, the bottom northern half. We only planned to top that road. We seen that was a mill and fill, and that we could add another two inch to each road. And we increased that budget by fifty grand or fifty five grand across three roads, and made it last a little longer. So that those are things that we take into consideration when we finalize the list. We go look at it if we determine collectively that these are the roads. We'll go put a little bit more uh, into it. You know, if we have to do core sampling or go do some panel grinding, we'll, we'll cut a hole if it's a concrete base and kind of look to see how deteriorated the base is. Those are all things we do to ensure that the road's going to come out the way we want it to. I wish I can give you a better answer, Cliff. Well, no, I, I think uh, you know we we can't quantify miles, so we can't quantify number of roads, but we're quantifying how much we're spending every year, and we're not going backwards. We guys, and that's all we can do at this point. You know, we have, we already just, we opened the meeting up with having a manpower issue to go forward with anything else. So I get it. So thank you. Yep. So then I heard the number 12, or whatever I think was what you had said to the mayor. So is it better to do less to do a quality job than quantity than later well, in the year? Well, not every road, two, inch and a half is what ODOT calls for their spec. That's, that's a, we're doing two inches, which is above the bar already. So if we go into a road that we know has a bad base and we're putting two inches of base, race roads and put five inches on that road. We added three inches of base and then we added two inches of surface heavy polymer. That road will probably be there when I retire, I hope. You know what I mean? That's a stout road. If, 
it's all about what your what kind of traffic's on that road. You get into you get into a lot of the the, the truck traffic roads like a race and a Maddox. You could dump a lot of money into those roads, but ultimately, if you know there's a lot of truck traffic, I don't care what you put on there. It's it's going to be time that's going to beat that road up, especially here in Ohio. You're putting salt down on concrete that don't mix well, and then if you're, you have asphalt and heat and heavy trucks, that don't mix either. So. But is it better to, to schedule less and add more as the year goes on? Well, we normally internally will have a list of just say 16 roads. If the mayor says, hey, our number is going to be this, and we go evaluate those roads together, uh, it's ultimately the mayor's decision to say, hey, I feel comfortable with this number. Do you feel comfortable doing it? If we get to the point where we say, hey, we'll keep these four roads on, on the back burner. we got enough time and enough money left, then we'll do the, the worst of the three roads. And that's an internal conversation we'll have. And then we kind of go from there. It's happened every year where we've added another road and went and did it because we had money and time. Um, but that's why we're having the conversation we're having today. Of, uh, you know, if we set the road at 10 or 12, whatever that number is going to be, I think we just need to keep it consistent moving forward. We're only growing. And any money that we save from that budget, we can always move to the concrete fund because we're not short of concrete roads in the city. You know? Yeah, I was happy to see there's an additional 100000 this year being requested for concrete. Um, I did have a question for the auditor. Um, what was budgeted in 2019 for concrete pads? It's blank at this point. And a different fund. That was uh, OPWC money to do concrete uh, work. So the, whatever we budgeted last year was increased by the OPWC money. Last year we did two hundred thousand. We're doing the same thing this year. This year we're doing three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. No, nineteen was not. When the engineer comes up, they'll be able to better explain that. But in two thousand nineteen, there was a grant grant dollars that were used. Okay. Now another question for you. Thank you. Go ahead. As you, I'm, I'm sure you're aware that uh, our major flooding areas, typically north of uh, Center Ridge, those neighborhoods there, mm -hmm. if we alleviate the flooding there, would it help our streets as far as keeping them uh, <laughs> in game? Anytime you can keep water off the road. You know, um, there's like Burmy, for example, anytime anything like falls on a roadway, it makes its way to the edge. It creates this, this um, the barrier to where the water can't get off the road. Road, road um, north of Bainbridge is a good example of that. You've seen how deteriorated just the edge was. It's because water just sat there. You know, now that the road's paved, we wouldn't shave all that road off so that all the water can get to the basins. Now you go look at it five years from now, you're going to start seeing that silt start to get. So berming is just as important as crack sailing or anything else. Anytime we can keep water off of a roadway, um, keep the road higher than the earth, you're always going to be beneficial for it. So if we have to sacrifice some street repairs in order to alleviate flooding, it would uh, serve the same purpose. It's just part of the balance we're trying to get to. It's, that's what we're trying to say. There's a balance. You know, there's a lot of ditches down there that Ray has ideas to um, try to get some of the water out of here quicker. Ultimately, I, I end up thinking that there's going to have to be some kind of communication with the people to the north of us on how we get this water out of uh, all of our cities collectively faster. That's I just think just to touch on that. I think the water recedes faster than I've ever seen it for what we work you guys have done already. It's just noticeable to me, and I live right in the middle of it. So honestly, I think I think uh, it's, it recedes faster than I've ever seen it at this point. I can also tell you that the uh, work that you did at Bagley and not Bagley uh, at Chester and uh, eighty three certainly improved that area greatly. I don't get I don't get complaints anymore. <laughs> That's great to hear. Usually it's just the complaints we get are from the stopping point. Or they're not, because <laughs> we didn't keep going. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the complaints was not the city city fault. Chairman, <clears throat> so Councilman DeVries, you'll, if you look just a little further down in that same fund, 225 Street Levy, you'll see the full depth concrete number of 250,000 for 2019. Got 
So that street levy fund, are we all set on the 550,000 that we're comfortable with? Your son. <laughs> I'm just thinking about Dennis. I just know he well <laughs> jump in. So I feel you're compelled to say that you may hear from him. I'm okay with it because I like I said I see the increase in the concrete pad request. So well I guess you could put money there. And if we got to a timeline within the year that we think that we're where you need to cut it off, you can always cut it off. And I, I can't speak for April, but I would say if, if you're still doing concretes at that portion. Why would, could we transfer that money that's remaining over to concrete pads and finish doing more concrete roads? I mean, that's an option too. I don't no. know how that side of it works. Last year we all, we were, I forgot where, maybe the mayor or April can remember, but we found an additional 250,000. We had auditor will check at the time, moved it over to, I believe it was paving. And we did wind up using it, it looks like. So I just want to make sure that we have enough money, so. If you look at the fund summary for 225, you'll notice that the fund is extremely tight at this point. Um, once the engineer comes in, he'll speak to all of the road projects that are slated for 2021, which um, does eat up the available resources in this fund. Um, I guess what I would ask uh, the committee to consider is perhaps um, let's take a look at if you, if you want to do more roads and it's feasible. Perhaps the better thing to do would be to um, analyze the fund at the beginning of the year, maybe the first four months in. We can always appropriate additional funds once we have a better gauge on what our revenues will do. Um, that's an option. Uh, if we're looking to move things around, we can, we can certainly look at that. Um, it's My only fear is that it's a pretty tight budget and it's a, a, a tight fund and it's gonna be a, a tight year next year. Is there any other options? As far as there are options, Bonnie. Thank you for asking. That was an, a great segue. So I mentioned this to you guys uh, last time that we met on Veterans Day. Uh, there is the $10 extra fee that we can add to vehicle registrations. Remember, uh, back in the day, we increased that fee by $5 in order to fund the Center Ridge Road project. Well, you know, it is a mechanism in which we just raise that registration fee by $10. We can gain over $300,000 a year that we could then use for asphalt or concrete. So um, it's, it's restricted money for road work. So if you want more money and more work to be done, that's a mechanism to get it done. To add to that, if we're limited out like that, state money, the legislature kind of looks at things as a, are you really helping yourself? Are you at the limits of where you should be? Because if you're not willing to go to the limit at the highest level, why should we give you more money? <laughs> so it does help to, to, when it gets to grants and stuff like that, that uh, from the state of Ohio it says, look, we've got this many, we're already at our limit. Where can we go from here? Because if you don't help yourself internally, locally, why does the state come in and give you the extra $5 or $10 to help you do it? So it just kind of adds to the ambiance of that, that uh, presentation. And I would say if, you know, if we get to the number or the time frame, in my opinion, means matters more that we get that road accomplished. If we have two or three roads that are still outstanding that we think we can get to, then we have that kind of money. You can always have a crossroads come in and do that type of work so we can get to the other things mm -hmm. utilize what we have at our disposal so Cause going, going back we originally thought was uh you kind of tapped out right now with your manpower with the same kind of budget we had last year where you went with this year anyways yep. right so we'd have to look at outsourcing or contracting anything additionally anyways which from what you said is almost twice as much to cost us to do well he did it, he did it off a of bid spec you know, I did some of the math just before I came. If he was to do it off of what we get for, for our bid when we put it out off our equipment rental, I'm thinking 10 to 15% you're going to save off that number right off the top. So that's just something to think about. I'm, if we get to the point where, you know, you're in just before October or, you know, middle of October and that's our cutoff and we say, hey, this is our last road. We're going to take whatever money we got left at divide whatever roads are there and see if uh, crossroads or whoever's going to come into those roads, do you have to bid those roads out if they're 150 grand individually? Do you have small money to I guess that's a question in the case. Well, if they're different yeah. roads. 
That's a tough things. one because if you're going to do a group of roads together, then it's going to be over two hundred eighty degrees. Okay. But if you're doing one road, just one. I'm not against bidding because I think it brings. And it's under. I'm just saying. It's an idea. It depends on the how many roads we're doing, the dollar amount. So if you're doing, April just finished her comment with, if you're doing one road and it's under 50, then you don't have to bid it. You know, Cliff, the money could be used for roundabouts, the, the elongated eight um, it, uh, intersections, stuff that we can't do. And uh, you would have to bid that out anyway. So this gives you additional money that you can get those intersections completed do the roundabouts, do that kind of stuff, and the peanut, and, and to have funds for that, and still do, and not just pile it in over there and hire contractors for the work that they can do. So it kind of gives you a bigger scope of work that you can do uh, for the community so that they can do the roads in between, but you got the intersections done, just as a thought. No, we also have an option that for somebody to eat. We got several roads in a row that were not really hard to do, you're able to get through fast, you'd have additional funds to go do more, right? And I understand that. But I just want to make sure I understood where we're starting from. Yeah. Like I said, if they want to add more uh, money to that line item, as long as we're under the understanding, like we're going to hit a certain time frame in the year, it's not like we're going to slow down just to not hit that number. We, Anthony, you get a pretty good idea if it's just mill and fills where you're going to end up time-wise. If it's roads that you get to that it's, it's concrete problems and we got to spend time fixing basins and whatnot, it's going to take a lot longer to do that road. So, concrete pads we talked about uh, was increased by $100,000 from last year. Um, catch basins. Um, catch basins is another thing I heard someone mention um, last year about when we, we do 50000 every year. That, that basin list never stops. Just because they did 100 basins, you can drive through any of the newer developments and already pick out one on every street, maybe two on every street that needs to be redone. So that list is, that money that might need to be increased over time. I don't know. I believe that figure was provided by the engineer. Mm -hmm. yeah. The remainder of uh, Fund 225 is going to be um, the engineering projects. Uh, we're going to get into the water fund. So you'll want to go flip in your binder to the utility operations tab under Enterprise funds. So our operating supplies within this fund is two hundred twenty-three thousand. We kind of just went off of the twenty nineteen numbers to try to make it work. Um, Ryan buys everything that's needed from saddles to master lugs and all that stuff for everything we need for, you know, copper lines, fittings, and all that stuff for all the water grade sewer stuff, all the water stuff. There's always extra at the end of the year in that fund because we have to keep 25, 30,000 set aside. If one of our pumps at the pump station goes down, that's what it costs to replace it. Badger meter is utilities. That's something that Whitlock would normally handle. Uh, that does need to be, that's why there's an increase in there. I put that in for them. We have just way more houses going in. They're going to need more meters and more equipment to keep those things installed. Correction, you technically did have to do that. Well, that's true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now it is. Oh. In that line item is also um, an antenna that needs to be replaced. Yeah. Uh, hydrants, we usually spend 25000 a year on hydrants. Um, in the past, yeah. it's been a lot more than that. We just subbed out 65, 65 hydrants to be done. So, How are we doing on that right now? It's out to bid. It just went out to bid. So, As far as the hydrants we have in the city, how will percentage would you say our service bid? Um, probably 85 to 90% are in good shape. But we have this year alone 25 hydrants that we've already replaced or repaired. This system is going to give us another 65, which is going to bring us right back up where we should be because it was several years past that 
five or six hydrants got done in a year when 15 or 20 should have. We try to shoot to get 18 to 20 hydrants a year replaced or repaired. Thank you. The only other high dollar thing on there is the water purchase, and that's a contract, correct? There's really no increases on the sewer fund side. Uh, Stormwater. operating supplies we kept under a hundred thousand dollars um last year when we did that uh bruce you brought it up that chestnut job that pipe job that's 40 grand we had to take out of that account you know we purchase all the hydro seed the material all the stuff we need out of that fund for ray it can be a pipe can be uh, fittings or anything like we need for when we go out to these jobs to get keep water um off of the outsides of the banks. You know, there's some things we come towards a bad piece of culvert, we gotta replace it. That's why that money's there. I had a quick question about the um under stormwater operations, wages and staff. I see in 2019 we appropriated two hundred and ninety eight thousand and now that number is quite dramatically lower, one hundred and one thousand. If we reappropriated the money for that, we, that things more so? we have reappropriated the entire um budget all across the board. Okay. People are actually getting paid where they're actually working on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think the other additional up there for the wage portion was the rig, correct? People? Yeah, so um, during the public meeting, we can't talk about specifics. Okay, go ahead. Um, but keep in mind that um, there was a couple of things that changed in here. So we reallocated the uh, street department, the folks into the funds in which they're actually working, as well as removing utility collections from stormwater. So that's where you're seeing the big difference. Thank you. There's really nothing less under stormwater. Most of that's just um, line items that were the same, pretty much the same as last year, almost identical. City garage, uh, moving in here. Um, I'm sorry. You want to go through um, Rick's equipment with us? Yes, you can. <laughs> April, can we can I see that real quick? Yeah. Well, I'll let Rick uh, run through this real quick and you can right on it. No, we're good. Here we go. Uh, just some basic stuff around the shop. We're we're looking to replace. Um, we have a we have an older lift um, that we're using, and it's a it's a lower height lift. We can't get some bands and and trucks up on it, so we want to replace that. It's a twin post lift. Um, the tire machine. I wanted to get a uh, an additional tire machine to do to make some tire changes. Some of the smaller tires easier. We have a newer machine that's working great for a lot of the bigger stuff uh, that go on the trucks, but it uh, just can't get some of the smaller stuff on the PD and uh, some of our lighter trucks and stuff like that. Um, so I'd like to add that. A bandsaw and the, and the um, is for metal work, our fabrication, um, and the sandblaster cabinet with ventilation. We just to clean up rusty parts and stuff as we take them off. We clean them up and can repaint them and stuff, put them on the truck just to preserve things. And then uh, we have uh, scrap metal within our shop, you know, old rotors, any, anything we cut off, you know, that's, that's just discarded. We uh, just need a place to put it so we can dump it in our dumpster in a bag right now. We just we make a pile, we have to transfer. You're, you're moving it like three times every time. So we just had a small little dumpster. We could put it on our forklift and dump it back 
into the metal scrap dumpster. So see you by now. See you by a lot there. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Thank you. So the city garage is under internal service. It's the last tab. So this one uh, for the motor vehicle parts and supplies, there is a slight increase on here to 153,000 from last year. The, the one thing, April, that, that's not in here, does it show you how much money that they have increased that throughout the year or no? This is pretty much the total. Yeah, so you can see that in 2019, the actuals were, um, so your budget with carry for that's why the number is uneven, was 139.2. You spent 112 of that. In 2020, with carry forward, your budget was 147.2. Um, so far this year, or as of October 30th, you spent 73,854. You had 20,366 encumbered at that point in time. Okay. What's included in this line um, from the equipment list was the additional plow blades, truck tires, and the digital radios. Yep. That's pretty much it for this one. All the other line items is I know you have the, the all the classes you'll see for the 5500. We we had that last year as well, but with COVID, it obviously uh, canceled a lot of those classes and everything. So we're going to try to get that in again this year. Get the welding classes. Yes. Yeah. Um, this storm utility that you guys have, this paper here. You guys go through these numbers. It's giving you a rundown of uh, all the 2019s and what we have so far this year through 2020. A little over 15 miles this year with the other machine we've added. Look to the map. Everything that's in the red on that map is all the things that we've done this year. Let's see. If you flip to the next picture, just to give you an idea of what it looks like after we cleared all the trees and left that from St. Pete's, that's what it looks like. Uh, final until we add the rail and what needs to go down that bike path rail. Um, the the next page is the weir wall, in case none of you guys have ever seen it. When it floods, the bottom picture, those are two twin 60 inch culverts that are under the, uh, the turnpike there that come out. And they're basically, even with that header wall, that's how much water is coming out from the turnpike and coming down this area. I know Bruce, you talked about um, avenues of areas that could be fixed. This would be one that we should focus on to help generate some more storage. Um, maybe maybe do something different on this rear wall. If a, there's a jam or something like the tree you see to the left of that, that ends up on this side and plugs that wall, then nothing can come through and control that flow through that gate like it's supposed to, then it'll fill up and come over the top. That's about the only way it's going to get out of there. Frontier Park, this is where we started the project over there. Um, the water is coming north under the culvert um, by Nino's. As it comes into the park, it goes through a series as a series of S curves, and um, you know it's already flooded that racquetball club out. I don't know how many times, Jeff, but it's been numerous times. So what we did was we slope cut the bank, so it goes from the bottom of the, the ditch bank all the way out to the highest portion of Frontier, and then we mounted all the dirt near the gas house, and we mounted on the side of the racquetball club. I think we raised it four feet five feet, something like that. We're gonna do the same thing on the north of the S curve where the homes are, where the water comes and has no place to go. So it goes over bank and then through the yard. So. John, do you have a sketch or drawing of this, this, um, this whole plan around that S curve, around the frontier, anything like that? No, um, we're still, we're with, as far as where the homes are concerned. It's like the whole impact in the, you know, the ditch itself along the homes. 
that that whole area we're waiting we're working in conjunction with engineering to basically get a plan we've talked about possibly moving that ditch over closer onto city's property the park's property um and create another mound and just kind of trying to see what the impact of that would be um once we can get those numbers and we would have something as far as drawn over that we haven't we haven't started any of that that, phase okay. of, that original ditch was a straight line you know, now it's got all these 90s it looks like a staircase mm -hmm. and that is part of the problem of getting that water out quicker it slows everything down yeah so we're working on it just wanted to get you guys a little idea of what is going on with storm water this uh, last paper that you guys have in front of you, um, I know there's been some questions about the um, digital speed signs. Just kind of want to let you guys understand the pricing. That's just for the signs if you buy a quantity of three or more. And then when you get to the uh, quotes, the quotes are the pedestals like you see in Avon. That's a $2,800 cost for them to, in, to put the signs in. And then the back page, that's 734 is for them just to mount on a regular 14 or 12 gauge square sign post. Just options. Um, you know, uh, my feeling on these signs, um, and I've said this repeatedly, is they're, they're just like any other sign page. You're going to put them up and people are not going to obey them. It's not like they're writing tickets or anything like that. You're going to put them in these developments and it might bring people's attention, but I don't, I don't think it's going to really do anything. We're moving those trailer units that we have now all over the place. And, you know, people call the minute we pop these things up in one street. Um, I've talked to you about it. It's, it's, you're going to get them on every single person that has a main thoroughfare through the city. They're going to want them. And, you know, you talk about 20 of them, you're looking at $122,000 and that's not including insulation. Um, that's a, that's a high dollar thing. And to me, um, when we did have them down there, um, we had them on the old concrete pedestals. You know what I mean? We were still, PD was still tracking the times. They were put on the hot list and they were going down there. All it's really doing is telling you the hot peak times that people are traveling and what rates of speed they're going when they're going through there. So those permit ones too are uh, easily taken out. I was behind a car who took one out on Stony Bridge. For sure. Yeah, he wasn't going very fast when he, when he took it out. Well, I, when I talked to um, Signal Service about their, their installation for the pedestal, he said that you like when you walk up and you shake it, it's pretty firm. But I just said, like you said, someone's going through Avalon and they hit ice and they take it out. We're going to be paying another 2800 plus whatever it's fixed compared to a regular 14-gauge square post. <clears throat> now, a 14-gauge post is not going to have uh, the sturdiness of the pedestal. But again, you know, I know that a lot of people are keen on these signs. I think they have their place in the city for a, for a high traffic area curve or something like that. But once we make the determination to put one up in one development, you're going to have every single person that's in an HOA here calling asking why they're not up in their main thoroughfares. And I think that could be a potential huge cost in the city. We currently have four, correct? We have two sets. Two yeah. sets. Two sets, which is four total. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And we normally... Um, if someone requests for them to go, we'll put them on that schedule, and then we usually wait about a month, and then we'll move them. How hard is it to move them? I mean, if you we, we, them we fabricated them. On, on, we have two trailers right now that we fabricated. We took the sign off the post and fabricated them into trailers. So they're basically you just hook up to a truck and you go drop it off. Um, they're currently after the B boxes get finished, uh, doing all the winter work. They'll fabricate the other two, and then we'll have two sets to be mobile wherever they need to go. So. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Thank you guys for your time and very good. I want to say thank you very much for uh, the budget you put together for us. It can seem you've consciously slashed some things and kept things very realistic. And uh, I appreciate all of you being here today to uh, you know give us the knowledge that you hopefully you guys did. So I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. It sounds like uh, you got a lot of outdated stuff that. Uh, Needs to be improved to increase your already really good efficiency. So, look forward to helping with that. Call the recess. Five minutes. Thanks, guys. Shake hands.
So you're going to turn to the oh, engineering tab, and over. it's the last two sheets in the binder is the engineer's uh, budget, and then we'll go into the couple of projects, which is just before that. Seeing that everybody's here, recommence with engineering. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I guess I'll just get started. Yes, sir. Please. Just highlight the significant changes in the operating section. Okay. Um, just going down from our 2020 budget to our 2021 budget, there's not really any significant changes. We still have the same number of full time staff. Um, during the summer, we would like to bring in a part time staff uh, intern of sort to um, help around the office and um, do some miscellaneous tasks. Um, all of our requested line items significantly match those of previous years. Um, are there any specific questions on any of our line items requested from um, any of our line items going forward? The only significant change I would say from last year to this year in our engineering budget would be that previous auditor will check um, had budgeted um, a lot of engineering uh, projects to be engineered out of our professional services line item, which had not been done in the past. So our professional services line item for 2020 was really high. Uh, we've gone back down to our normal um, allocation of approximately $40,000. And in our other professional services, we um, have about 46400 which is uh, typical of what we've carried on for um, all the years that I've been here um, and previous too. So there's not really any significant changes other than those two. Does anybody have any questions on any of the other lines? We do have our membership education line item is at 7,500. I do have one staff member who is finishing up a degree who may be eligible for uh, some more reimbursement. So that's why that line item is kind of high. Um, otherwise, um, all the rest of them are congruent to what they've been in the past. And as you can see, we're um, pretty much at our 2019 number uh, for our budget, slightly above. Unless you want to get into more detail, but I, I'm not sure. Does anybody have any questions? It looks pretty consistent with 2019. And uh, yeah, I don't see anything that's jaw dropping or anything that's out of the ordinary. I will say this that um, we are very fortunate to have three professional engineers that work for the city of North Ridgeville. Um, so, part of that seven full time staff, we have three professional engineers, myself. Uh, Christina, our assistant city engineer, and Eric. And we will have a fourth degreed engineer um, after the new year. So um, this department has grown since I've come here and um, our, our background and our professional people have grown. And I think that is an excellent value and asset to the city in general. Are there any other openings on your staff at this time? Um, at this point, we do not have any openings. Um, we are full fully staffed. I do see a need maybe in 22 for an additional staff, but it's all going to be dependent upon our um, building space. Um, obviously, we have a shortfall of space. So. Do you have anybody who's planning on retirement this year? There are no planned retirements. I don't believe we'll have any planned retirements um, for several years. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. There may be one in a couple of years, but not anytime soon. Thank you. Question I I'll have uh, on the Sugar Road, uh, Sugar Ridge Sewer Extension 83 to Maddox. Oh, so well, I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do we want to hold back on that? Yeah, let's go through the project. We're gonna go through the whole I'll just go through the project list. The whole We'll start at the annual catch basin rehab. Okay. And um, we'll just go through the whole eight pages. And <laughs> excuse me, as we have any questions, just let me know. And uh, I'll elaborate. So for the last few years, we've been doing an annual catch basin rehab project. 
that project has been successful. Uh, we are going to continue with that in 2021 to the tune of $50,000. Um, our project this year encompassed, how many did we do this year, Christina, do you remember? 50? We did about 50 this year to the tune of $40,000. So we did have a little bit left over in our 2020 budget that was basically returned to the street levy. Um, so next year we'll go ahead with the same amount at 2021. We'll go with $50,000. Um, and those uh, are, that list is provided by the service department and we will work around the city wherever, you know, whatever list that they provide, we'll bid that out and we'll get as many done as we can for that dollar amount. Um, our annual full depth concrete projects, we're going to use uh, levy R300,000 with, um, if you skip down two lines to our OPWC project for 21 and 22 grant period, we're going to leverage R300 to obtain our 400 from, um, excuse me, OPWC, our Ohio Public Works Commission. And being with that, we'll be able to get 700,000 done. And I believe this uh, resolution was passed at council a couple of weeks ago. Those street segments are not listed here, but they were attached to that resolution. Any questions on that? Okay. Mills Road Bridge over French Creek. This is a project we've been working on for several years now. There was um, basically a year's holdup <coughs> working with the city of Avon. We have moved past that point. And we are at the point of a right of way acquisition. We had a couple of small temporary easements that needed to be acquired. They have been acquired and we are moving forward. We should see construction on that. Um, I want to say it sells sometime next year. Um, I don't have the exact date, but it will start next year. So at some point next year, that bridge will be replaced. Um, we do have um, some placeholders here for our costs. We do have a grant of 768,600 from the state of Ohio. That is a 100% grant. So hopefully, um, we're hoping that this project comes in at a very good price. And if it comes in um, at that number below, we may obviously lessen our need for contribution based on the spreadsheet here. But um, if everything goes in well and we come in below budget, if the construction cost covers everything, um, our numbers are actually go down and we'll have a cost savings. I have a question. Yes. Is North Ridgeville putting the entire bill for this bridge or is Avon sharing with the cost? Avon will be sharing in any construction costs over the 100% um, grant. So they are willing to share in the cost of any construction costs over the grant amount. Um, we are also, if depending on how this goes, we are also going to apply for another grant, um, which is applied during the summer. Uh, it's called a TID grant, and that comes from the county. And if we can get that grant, that's about 250000 We may not need it, um, so we don't really want to apply for it until after we bid the project. Um, but also, that would help in any of these cost line items and, and obviously lessen our costs and obviously lessen the city of Avon's costs as well. So it all depends on where this bid comes in. I believe that this bid um, will come in at or below our um, construction estimate as it is right now. Any other questions? All right, so moving forward, we have our bridge at Maddock Road. Um, we just are continuing uh, our general fund engineering with some railroad expenses. Uh, we have to work with the railroad because we're gonna be really close to their right away with this bridge. Um, we went ahead and pushed out the construction till um, 2022 because there's a lot of coordination efforts that need to happen between the city, the railroad, um, in order to get this to um, construction. So those efforts are going to continue to take place in 21, and hopefully in 22, we will be able to replace that bridge. Any questions there? I just ask what. What type of expenses for that 15000 what would be? The railroad? Basically, they, the railroad takes the plans, they review them, they charge to review them, um, and we have to pay for that. So basically, that's what that's covering at this point. There will be uh, additional fees that may be in our 2022 budget based on um, they're also going to charge us for if we're working within the cross crossing itself or very close to it, 
they want to have somebody from their staff there all the time. So there may be additional costs in 22 associated with that. I don't have those costs right now, but this 15,000 is just basically for them to start reviewing our plans um, and providing us info for you know any comments they might have. So then is the plan contingent on what they review? Moving forward with the project? It depends. We're moving the bridge south, so we won't be in there right away anymore. Right now, the bridge is par partially in the right away, um, the existing bridge. And all we're going to do with the existing bridge is basically drill a couple holes through the top of it and fill it up with foam or cement, um, for lack of better terms. The, um, the bridge is going to be moving about 100 feet south from its current location be, to be able to, right now it makes two 90 degree bends to get underneath the railroad. And we want to soften that because we're getting a lot of erosion on what would be the southwest corner of that bridge right now. So we want to move that south and basically skew it, put it on an angle to be able to get that water to flow softer through the two turns in order not to have that erosion problem. Um, being that we're moving the bridge out of there right away, they won't have much to say. Thank you. Question for you on that. Will that uh, also alleviate the uh, ditch on Sugar Ridge on the uh, between Waterbury and Sugar Ridge? Will it help it flow better? Yes. Um, right now, it hits a, a, a wall when it gets up to that point. Um, that's the Cheeseman Ditch. Uh, being able to soften that turn will allow flow to flow easier through there. Um, so I'm digging how, it up also faster. Correct. How to quantify that? Will it go faster? Yes. But on the north side of the bridge, there's also a couple of bends that it takes. So it kind of will hit another wall, but it's out of uh, right away. It's in private property. So um, at that point, we really don't have much control. But yes, it will help the flow going out. Any other questions? So our next line item, uh, budgetary um, for 2021 is going to be a Learnagle and Mills Road roundabout. That is a more of a placeholder than anything. At this point in time, the city of Avon has, um, excuse me, applied for a grant with the state of Ohio, a 100% safety funds grant for this job. If they are awarded that grant, um, depending on what the award is, um, it also covers the design as well as the construction. So depending on what that grant is and how much they actually get will depend on how much we actually participate. Um, this 135 is a 50% participation at this point, but that number could vary based upon um, the grants. And we will not know about safety grants um, until after July, or excuse me, January 1st of 2021. Um, so we still need to be prepared for that if, if no funding is available, because the city of Avon does want to move forward with this project. And um, we are going to be a 50% uh, participant in that project. Any questions? There's some work being done over there right now, isn't there, at the intersection? Correct. There's some corrective pavement work going um, yeah. on over there. There was a manhole that kind of sunk down, some pavement issues around that. Um, I believe they're, they're making those corrections. And that work should be done. It should have already been done. If it's yeah, I actually done. had, I'm at the bank, obviously, the town of the street for Spider Lakewood, and uh, three different customers came in and they were really elated that that was being taken care yeah. of. So, yeah, it's definitely going to help with that transition coming, um, excuse me, coming southbound out of Avon into North Ridgewood. There was a, a nasty bump there for a while. Thank you. And I was asked about that just the other day. Why are we spending this kind of money in that location if we're going to do the roundabout? But as you can see, the roundabout's not scheduled for construction until 22. So yeah. for us to go another two years with the condition existing like it is, just wasn't going to work. Yeah, that's going to rattle your teeth, too. It was a pretty it was, <laughs> The expenditure was minimal um, for the benefit. So I think uh, it was definitely something that was warranted. Our next project is um, also going to be on Maddock Road. Uh, we need to have some engineering and possibly a wall design done on the north side of the railroad tracks at Maddock Road. Um, we have encountered some sinking pavement and we believe that the retaining wall may be undermining. So we are going to have to have an engineer and a geotechnical engineer go out there, do some drilling, get some core samples, and find out what's going on and then we may have a project to do there um, 
in 22 or 23, but we need to do some preliminary engineering first. So that's what that line item is. Any questions on that? And that would be on the east side of the road. All righty. Sugar Ridge uh, rehabilitation. We have a, a line here for some engineering to take place. We are looking to have this job through NOACA. Um, we were not in the current TIP, um, which is their transportation improvement plan. Um, they have us out uh, a couple of years. So we're hoping to at least have our engineering done. And that way, when we do get on the TIP, we're ready to go and we can be funded immediately. Um, those communities through NOACA who are ready to um, go when their projects are called to the table are likely put at the, the top of the list versus somewhere at the bottom. So the, the more prepared we are with this project, um, the better our chances are of getting it done sooner rather than later. Um, we have it in our 2023 for construction, um, but it all depends on what uh, the term <coughs> is. I wanna say um, fiscal year 24 is tw summer of 23 into 24. And I believe that's when the next tip starts. And, and speaking with Randy Lane from uh, NOACA, who was director of programming, um, he believes that we'll be in the next tip round for that job. So we just need to start getting prepared for that. And that's what that <coughs> is. And that would take us from our city limits at Elyria all the way east to Waterbury Boulevard, where we just um, finished doing some paving. Will that road be shut down altogether when they do this project? No, traffic will be maintained. It's basically going to be a mill and fill project. Um, we're also going to submit for, um, with our application, we submitted for sidewalks on both sides of the road, um, all the way through to Elyria. Um, so it is going to be a comprehensive project. It will definitely be traffic maintained. There will be no closures. Um, Are those sidewalks paid by the city or the residents? They would be paid by 80-20. So it would be... Um, by the city, whatever, um, by city and the lack of funds, federal funds. So do we have the purchase easements or right of ways or anything? Nope, there's no need for purchase of right of way. We have 60 feet of right of way out there. Um, we're not changing the road. The road's going to be the same. It may, we may have a wider paved shoulder, um, but we have 60 feet of right of way, just like on any other residential neighborhood street in any subdivision. Um, so the only reason um, we like to or excuse me, NOACA likes to add sidewalks because it does make it um, bike and pet um, friendly. So they actually look at those projects with more, um, they give more points per se. So that's another reason why we added the sidewalks there. And plus with Waterbury Boulevard having a, we'll ha eventually have a fitness trail as well. Um, just tying into that, we're just getting our community to be more mobile at that point for bike and pet. Any other questions on that? <laughs> okay. Uh, currently, on our next line item, we have our Mills, Stony, and Avalon roundabout. That roundabout is in design currently. That will continue uh, through the remainder of this year and probably a majority of, of 21. And uh, sometime during the 21 um, calendar year, we'll have to buy some portions of right away. So that line item is there. Also, um, the, there was a portion of the engineering that was not funded by our NOPEC grant that is there on that line item. And hopefully, um, going forward, if we decide to pursue this project, we'll build it in 2022 um, at the estimate cost there. And that estimate will be refined as we go along. As the plans continue to be developed, um, that estimate will be uh, updated. But that is our current estimate at this time. That project being shared with Avon? That project is not being shared with Avon. Um, I would say out of it, 90% of it is in the city of North Ridgeville. Um, that was something that, you know, with congestion and things going on and being that that intersection is an offset intersection as it is, we decided to move ahead with the project there and being able to use the SNOPEC grant for the design aspect of it saved us um, 110000 So moving forward with that project was kind of um, just a city of North Ridgeville project. So we will be funding that one completely on our own, but we will have to coordinate obviously with our neighbors to the north um, on any aspects within the right of way that are going on in their side. So they're gonna have to approve our plans. Um, and 
at this point, uh, we've had uh, pretty good conversations um, with our neighbors to the north on this project, and they're, they're in favor of it. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Dan, Dan, I think you just gave Avon a new name. Yeah, from now on, we don't know our neighbors, neighbors to the north. We just call them neighbors to the north. Well, it's like Michigan, right? Exactly. Right. 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 Um, I like the northern community. <laughs> northern community. <laughs> neighbors is too nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our next project is Ranger Way. That was will be closed by the end of this year. Obviously, if you've not driven through, it is complete. Um, there's some miscellaneous dirt work going on, but that's uh, outside of the limits of the project. But at this point, that project is complete and all that budget is closed out <clears throat> by the end of this calendar year. Um, skipping down to Chestnut Ridge and alternate 83 roundabout. Currently in council is the ordinance for the construction of this project. Um, it will be funded with our round 34 OPWC loan and grant. And um, last year we went out for bond notes for this job. So as you can see here, that's all accounted for. Um, that job will likely bid in the month of January. Um, I'm looking to have that start as soon as the weather breaks. So hopefully sometime in April. Um, that will be probably about a three month project with a two month, either a two to three month closure. So that will be a full closure of that intersection. The detour will be um, north, excuse me, south to Lorraine and Butternut, and then east or west on Butternut Lorraine to get back around to whichever side you're going to. So um, that detour was approved for the county portion of Butternut Ridge going to the west. Um, the county uh, engineer's office has approved that. So we'll be moving forward with that detour um, and this project uh, just after the new year. Any questions on that one? Is there a plan in place for the intersection now of uh, Lorraine and 83 with the added traffic that's going to be going through there? We have not um, <coughs> added traffic as in just for this detour. Yeah, every um, detour, they're going to be heading south and they're going to hit Lorraine and probably head over to 83. And we concerned. typically don't do any improvements outside of that. I mean, it's a detour. It will just be, there might be some extended light times there. That's what, um, what we could look at during the project is if there's an issue there uh, with backup that we extend the east-west Lorraine Road timing on that light. Um, but I would have to get with signal service. And if it's a problem during the contract, we can have somebody come out and do so, um, change those timings. So it'll let a little bit more east-west time um, to get that cleared out. Okay. We'll do we do that during the project. How long will that detour be in place? And it's hard to say. It'll be in place at least 60 to 90 days. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right, our next project um, is Barris Road realignment at Stony. And that project will um, be done next year. We are going to do the engineering internally for that project. So Christina and Eric will um, do the design and, and get that done. And then we'll bid that job out sometime during the summer and get that completed for 2021. And basically that will be taking uh, the existing Barris Road and making it basically curve into the existing uh, new subdivision road that's, uh, I think it's called Ravenna, that exits out of Northridge Point. Is that gonna consist of a light? There will be no light. It uh, does not warrant a light at this point in time. Um, it'll just be a, a two-way stop con control like it is today. Um, is that entrance to Meadow Lakes going to be closed as long as the other development at any point? Entrance to Meadow Lakes. Off of Ferris or is that entrance? No, it, de it depends on how. We could probably still use the existing while we build the new and then flop over because there's so much space there. Um, so they'll probably use the existing road at Ferris and Stoney to maintain traffic. We can build the new curved section and then, so there will be no need to close anything at Meadow Lakes. It'll all be open. So is this going to be similar to a Chestnut Bay Bridge where you've got to kind of go to the right to go to the left to see oncoming traffic? No, this should line up where you'll be able to see north and south perfectly fine now. Yeah. Any other questions? 
Um, our favorite project ongoing is our center risk improvement <laughs> project. Um, I will say that it looks good as it stands today, except for we don't have a surface course and traffic lights yet, but they are going up. Um, so as you can see, if you haven't seen the, the highway lighting is going up, so all the light posts are going up. Those are all the LED lights. So it will probably be pretty bright out there um, during the evening hours. Um, and there's a lot of them. So they're about every 50 feet, um, there's a light. So um, that's going on. That work will continue through the winter. And we are on schedule to be the first pavement done by Shelly Company in the spring. Um, so everything ancillary will be finished and will pave in the spring. And hopefully by June 1st, <laughs> June 15th, we'll be all said and done finally with the um, improvements on Center Ridge Road. Um, I can't really speak to our overages at this point. Um, we are budgeting a million and a half of overages for 2021. That number, I'm going to tell you right now, is going to increase. Um, we did have some underruns or negatives in the budget. Um, so there will be a balancing, but there are a lot of overages. So we will. Um, continue to visit that and work with ODOT on that. But um, at this point, I don't see this project being closed for a multitude of years, maybe two or three years after we're done. So we won't really know that final budgetary number um, for a few more years. So as long as we keep our budgets and um, keep preparing for that, um, as we get closer to the end, um, we'll know more about where we stand uh, in overages. Dan, does ODOT have complete control over the approval of the coverages, or do you have the input? Um, when needed, they ask for our approval, but um, no, they, they have their own change order process. They approve all the change orders. Um, we have been in discussions with them throughout the project, but it's not necessarily our project. We're, we're on the outside, but we have signed on to, you know, basically in our agreements, we've signed on to cover those overages. So anything that's not being federally funded through the project, um, or above the uh, project budget limits, the city has signed on to uh, pay for those. I will say that we're probably going to have some sort of litigation, um, depending on what those numbers are. If they're absorbing it, there will definitely be litigation. But I mean, if, if we have a budget and the city feels and, and, you know, we'll have to speak with our law department and whatnot, and the mayor and say service director. But if we feel that the the expenses that are above um, or that are absorbing it are are we can cover them and you know litigation is going to be more than that we may just go ahead and, and pay the bill it it all depends and I don't have those answers right now and sure it may take us a few years it's going to take a few years to get there it's definitely going to take a few years and we won't have that answer for a, a number of years I would say it's going to be at least we won't be done till twenty one so by the time they final out the project we'll be into 22 and it could be 23 or 24 by the time we even actually see anything. So that's kind of where we stand. We, but we do need to have our, our reserve fund in place to be able to cover our um, expenses when the project is done. And there are legitimate overages that we must cover. Um, so essentially they just do something and send us a bill. Right? And basically. We're going to get a bill at some point. We already have gotten a bill for some of these overages, um, but we have not paid that bill because a lot of it has to do with the utility delays. So um, we're, I think we should need to stand at the point where we're not covering any utility delay issues until it's all been ran through the proper channels. So a lot of the changes that have been done on the project have been because of utility delays. And um, so I don't feel that the city should pay that bill for utility delays yet until we've gone through a proper audit of that, basically. And then by not paying that, that's not slowing the process. We're still aiming for Correct. No, we're still going to finish the job. The job's going to be done. Um, ODOT's going to fit that bill, I guess, until it's done. Um, and at some point, you know, whenever, whatever it gets decided upon, we will end up paying something, what that number is, I don't know. <clears throat> but I will say this, just so we're all on the same page. 
like this was a $60 million total project. At this point, I think we've invested 3 million, which is about 5%. So even if we had, as a community, even if we spent $6 million in totality for a $60 million total project, getting a $60 million project for 6 million is a bargain. So I think you need to, do that. We have, when it comes down to it, we need to look at the broader scope um, but we will do our homework and we will make sure that we're not paying more than we should, but there is a broader scope here. So any other questions on that project? I'll give my lawyer speak. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> I like saying that for Mayor Corcoran. <laughs> um, so our next project is State Route 83 in Chestnut Ridge. Um, we did have a traffic study done there. We did. We also applied to um, ODOT for a 100% safety project there. We will know after January 1st of this, of, excuse me, 2021, um, sometime in January, whether our project uh, earned enough points to be funded and at what level. Um, it may not be 100% funded. It could be funded at a, an 80-20 level or some sort. Um, so that's, um, we don't have anything budgeted for 21, but if we do get funded, we will have some budget money there for 22, for 2022. So um, we're hoping to have that funded because that will just work greatly in, in coordination with our new roundabout at the alternate 83 and um, Chestnut. Our next project here is Cypress Avenue uh, roadway extension. This is the extension of the existing Cypress Avenue to uh, Lorraine Road, opening up that area for development um, and continued development. Um, right now we're in engineering for that. And um, once that engineering is complete, hopefully next year we'll be able to construct that project. So those are the line items there to uh, construct that. That money's coming out of the TIF fund for that area, which uh, there's plenty of money in there to cover the cost of this project. Yeah, it's coming out of TIF district number three. Um, our next project, consequence, these next ones are um, out a few years. We're gonna go into our, our next page, it's uh, sewer projects. Uh, we recently solicited <laughs> letters of interest from consultant engineers for the engineering portion of the Center Ridge sewer extension from Barton to the Westlake border. Uh, we are currently reviewing those letters and we should have an engineer. Um, I'd like to have an actual ordinance to council for our next council meeting and be able to get that engineer on, on board within the next uh, month or so to be able to start the engineering for this project. Um, so we'd like to get that money um, acquired or encumbered in 2020. And then you'll see here we have the construction and inspection costs in 2021. Uh, we're looking at this being about a six month design process. So we're looking at having those designs done by June, July, um, and be able to bid the project and start construction in August. There is an ODOT resurfacing project that will be happening on that end of the city in 2020. Three. So we need to make sure we're out of the way, get our work done before that project happens um, in 2023. How is this project going to help the community? Are they all currently septic right now? There's, that whole leg of the city is currently on septic systems, which okay. are by the, excuse me, by the health department's recommendation failing. Um, there is a large uh, residential, excuse me, uh, multi-site family building at the very end of West, uh, at the Westlake border that has a failing system as well. Um, so, you know, in, in essence, we need to start extending our sewers <laughs> to be able to take um, these areas off of septic and get them into um, regular sewer service. So that's what this project is aimed towards. We have a couple others down the line here, but um, there is upwards of 100 homes or more out there that will uh, come off of septic um, that will not be discharging their effluent right into our river, our ditches and our streams. So that will definitely clean up that end of town um, immensely. So that uh, multi, um, 
this property that is basically an apartment down there. Correct. They're tied into a septic? They are. They have their own basically wastewater treatment plant on site that is failing. Okay. Um, they are under orders by the EPA to basically have that pumped once a month. So, you know, this project is obviously going to be a benefit to them. They'll be able to tie in um, and not have to do that pumping every month and be able to get rid of that septic system uh, wastewater treatment plant that they have on site. Um, being able to get rid of that, you know, we'll tie them in. Um, we'll be collecting tap in fees from all, every property owner here to help aid in these costs. So there will be a reduction in costs. But the benefit really is, is that we're getting rid of these antiquated systems that have been out there for 50 to 100 years, let's just say. What are the tap-in fees? Uh, residential tap-in fee at this point is 89, 80 something. I don't know the exact figure. Um, and a multifamily building like that depends on um, units and water meter size. So I have to figure that building out individually. So do the people that this is gonna affect, are they gonna be made aware of this? Correct, they have been. Sooner rather than later? They have been. Um, there's been a multitude of people that have actually called and they have been aware. Okay. Yeah. And Mr. Rodriguez, is the building department advised of these particular projects? Because I have one resident who was caught by surprise and he had paid for a new septic system. And Where is not, this? It was on Sugar Ridge. That was on Sugar Ridge. Yeah. That happened before, um, a few years before we put in the sewer. So I believe he was granted a um, he's an extension. to stay at this point, but eventually right. he's going to have to. Yeah, tap and in. he would definitely be required to tap in, but at this point, he's going to be granted an extension. As long as the building department, because you know yourself, sometimes it'll slip by and a resident will start to uh, the health improve department, their septic system. And then the building department should be advising them. The, there's no permit through the building department for a septic system. Okay. Uh, it all comes through the health department. So actually there's, and at this point, Mark, um, who works for the health department, our contact, Mark Smith, he is aware of this project. So he knows that if anybody calls on Center Ridge to basically, they're just to kind of milk it along until we get done with this project. Um, and then at that point they can decide um, they're gonna have to tie in. Well, there's options for them to, to uh, through assessments to finance it in a way. I believe that um, they can do an assessment through our treasurer's department and put it on their taxes, then yeah. the, the, the tap in fee uh, over a period of however many years, right. 10, how many? 10. 10 years, 10 years. Okay. Um, so they could do that. They can definitely do that. And then that way that assessment will just come off their taxes monthly. They'll increase their house payment a little bit, but sure, sure. it's definitely better than coming up with it uh, all at once if you can't. But that also means the city's going to have to put up the money. Up well, the we've already budgeted that. That's already budgeted. We're paying for this project no matter what. Um, the people that decide to go ahead with an assessment um, will definitely get that money back down the line. But they're also going to be paying interest. So it all depends. Balances are up. Um, it all depends. Yeah, it all depends on who decides to pay and who doesn't and how many of those cases we have. But at this point, we're, this project is fully funded. We're, we're moving forward um, with this project as long as it's approved in the budget. Um, all the money is there in our sewer improvement fund to do so. Okay, skipping down to Center Ridge Sewer Extension. Um, this project is, we would like to extend the sewer that we uh, just put in last year on Sugar Ridge. Um, up to uh, where we eliminated the West um, Westfield treatment plant. So now we want to take it from that point and continue it east down Center Ridge to approximately 83. Um, that project will open up uh, some land for development that's industrial. So hopefully we might um, take off with some development there, but also get failing systems along Sugar Ridge Road um, from where we stopped with our Westfield treatment plant project and move and continue that to the east to 83. Um, that is part of the master sewer plan to do so at some point in time. Um, and it was just uh, a project that we decided to move forward with. Any questions on that one? 
How many homes does that affect? There's a few businesses and then there is a handful of residential, um, maybe 10 residential. Um, but there's a few businesses on what would be the north side of the road and also a lot of vacant land that possibly would entertain uh, future development for and it's industrial land. So it could entertain the fact that uh, for business because there is no sewer there now. Um, if somebody was to go into that land today uh, and build something, they would have to put in their own sewer treatment plant to the tune of a multitude of dollars. And, and um, being that if we can get this sewer there, they can tie in eventually at some point and um, be able to develop that land better. Again, there's no money in the uh, Center Ridge sewer extension uh, line right now, but can you explain that project? Yes, so going back up um, to the Center Ridge sewer extension, Chuck Smuffler property. Um, as we know, we've put in a sanitary sewer on Center Ridge Road and we had to stop in front of Chuck Smuffler as the city encountered uh, fuel within the ground that caught fire. Um, a lot of that was remediated, but now since that is now right away, we kind of are responsible for anything uh, further in that area. At this point in time, Chuck Smuffler is moving ahead with a new septic system and not tying into our system, as far as I know. And that was the last correspondence we've had. They're moving ahead, so they're going to be fixing their issue. They did have a sewer issue, a septic system issue, that the Ohio EPA was mandating that they get their um, septic system pumped every month and cleaned out because they had a bad septic system. They are remediating that with a new system. Um, but there was some properties on Center Ridge across the street that, um, and adjacent to Chuck's Muffler that were not being able to get sewer. So we do have an interceptor manhole at the rear of Zodiac that we could pull a line off of eventually in the future if need be to pick up um, Chuck's Muffler and um, the vacant piece of parcel next to Chuck's Muffler before you get to the storage um, complex. So there is some, some latitude there with sewer that we can do. Um, also, there are mul multiple properties on the north side of the road that do not have sewer that there is interest in developing at least one of those parcels. We do have right away next to those parcels and we do have the ability to bring up sewer um, from Ridgeview Boulevard over through some right of ways that we uh, own. And um, so in the future, if we decide to move forward with that project, we could bring over sewer from Ridgeview um, along some right of ways to get those few parcels on Center Ridge Road to have sewer service um, and be able to be developed into commercial businesses or whatever they're going to be. Um, but though, that's just a placeholder at this point. We don't have anything there because we really haven't decided whether that's going to take off or not. If I believe if a commercial business came in and wanted to um, present to planning commission that they wanted to build on those parcels, that you know, at that point we would make any necessary modifications to the budget and reappropriate funds to be able to do those projects. But at this point, um, nobody's come forward with anything to for those parcels. But it is something that we'll eventually need to do, so that's why it's there as a line placeholder. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so again, we're going to do our, our Center Ridge Sewer Extension, or excuse me, uh, Sugar Ridge Sewer Extension project. Um, that will also include a, a repaving of the road. So basically, if we get our NOACA project done in a couple of years. We had that middle section done with our other sewer extension project. Uh, basically, Sugar Ridge Road will be resurfaced within the next couple of years between um, 83 and the Illyria border. Um, so we should be good there for pavement for 10 to 20 years. Now, another question I have mm -hmm. uh, pertaining actually to Shady Drive. Okay. We have residents there who have expressed interest in bidding sanitaries and also sharing some of the cost in that because they're all facing uh, septic systems that need to be replaced. Correct. So they can use that money for sewers. Is that under any kind of consideration? Because we did look at that, but the number of homes versus the cost, 
is it wasn't something that was feasible. Okay. Um, so that's why we haven't really pursued that avenue because there's only 10 homes and I think we're looking at half a million dollars or more um, just in a, in a ballpark estimate to do that. And at 10 homes, we would only be collecting uh, $90,000. So um, it wasn't, and it wasn't cost feasible to do so at this point. So it, it's not something that we were looking at. Um, our next project on here is a storm sewer extension project at on State Route 83. We had this budget in 2020. We weren't able to get to it, so it's just carrying over to 2021. Questions on that? Our next sheet is water improvement projects. Our first one up is um, Stony Ridge Road. That one has bid. We actually did come in at seven, around 720 for that. So we're actually under our million dollar estimate by a couple hundred thousand, excuse me. Um, so that will enable us to do some more work within our water fund should we choose to later on. But we did end up coming in under budget on that project. Um, so we did not get to the water lines at Creekside Pine Condos full replacement. Um, that will carry forward. We are going to start the engineering. Um, we should be underway with engineering sometime next month. Um, and then construction will follow in 2021. So those dollars will just be reappropriated. Currently in 2020, we're going to be doing some hydrant replacements. Depending on how that project goes, maybe we'll do a, a, another set in 2022. Um, based on what we got here. Uh, we're also looking to get underway the engineering for Lorraine Road 16 inch water main extension. Um, if you don't know, there currently ETL 1 runs down Lorraine Road on the north side of the road, which is Avon Lake Regional Waters uh, main line that feeds Medina. And uh, all of the services on Lorraine Road from Learnagle to uh, basically the Howell Turnpike run off of that line they want us to be remove all of the services because that's their main transmission line and they're really protective of it and we probably shouldn't have any services but we didn't have our own individual line at that point and as that continued to develop they allowed us to uh, different businesses to be able to hook on to their main so we need to put in our own water line on lorraine road from Lear, Learnagle cook, Inter cook road intersection to the west um, we'll probably just go past Bliss Court, Bliss Parkway, and um, we need to start the engineering on that. I'll have that hopefully encumbered by the end of the year, and then next year we'll also um, get that constructed. So that's what that line item is. Any questions on that? Yeah, does that mean the hospital's tied into the back line right now? The hospital is tied into that line. Um, there will be a transition at some point off of that line. Um, the hospital had to, unfortunately, the hospital had to do some extra work when they built to be able to be tied off of that line. They had to put in a pressure reducing valve and a, and a valve chamber and do some different things um, because that line runs at such high pressure. Um, but they did so, obviously they wanted to be located there at, um, with no qualms, but yeah, they will be transitioned off of that line and onto our main um, in the future. How long will they be without water during that transition? Um, hopefully it'll just be a couple hours, one day. Okay. Um, all the line will be put in place and it'll just be a, a turn of the valve, maybe a couple different hookups and, and they're back on. So um, it will be something that will definitely have to be scheduled weeks in advance so they can you know do what they need to do um, with their patients. But yes, it would probably be one day um, that they will be out of water. Thank you. So that'll affect businesses want it mcdonald's first it will um it depends on where they're fed i don't know if mcdonald's is fed off lorraine or off of lear through the back side there but it will affect all two the businesses um, and again those services will be um <coughs> services are usually just a couple hours but the big ones the hospital is a big service connection um i believe they have an eight inch main so that will be a bigger ordeal to be able to handle but um any of the smaller one inch three quarter inch taps, two inch taps. Those are pretty uh, small and can be done within a few hours and turned back on, so. 
but they'll all be scheduled. They'll all be notified well in advance of that um, to be able to make any arrangements that they need to make um, for their businesses. Any other questions on that? Um, all the other projects here are uh, basically placeholders for the future. Uh, we are, would like to do, you know, roughly a million dollars worth of water line work every year um, going forward. So that's what those placeholders are for. Um, and at some point uh, there, we had a study done a few years ago that said that the community in an emergency situation only um, could use a two million gallon tank. So um, new water tank. So that's something that we'll need to look at in the future should we decide to pursue that. Um, it was not needed. It's basically only if there was a, an extreme emergency based, but based on the report that we received that we would need that tank. Um, there is a possibility of working with Avon Lake Regional Water um, on them putting a tank in the community, which would uh, in turn help our pressures. So um, and we may not need that tank at that point. Uh, that's just a place, excuse me, a placeholder at this point. Um, on to the next page, which is stormwater projects. Uh, our ongoing Mills Creek Conservation and Flood Control Project, we have successfully used up the million dollars in the first grant that we got through land purchase and reimbursements for engineering at this point. So grant one is done and closed. We've been reimbursed. Um, everything from that grant to date. Um, grant two is ongoing. We are currently in the right of way acquisition phase, um, currently stalled, but <clears throat> working, moving ahead with that. Uh, the remaining grant two will reimburse. Uh, we have $440,000. Um, basically, that will be used for uh, the rest, excuse me, the rest of the engineering design work and um, any right of way acquisitions that we need for easements to be able to get the water off of Mills Creek into the um, this flood control area. Um, we'll need approximately four easements at this point in time. And um, that value at this point in time is roughly around 300,000 um, to be able to purchase all those easements. So basically this last grant, grant two, um, will cover remaining design costs and uh, acquisition for these easements. And we currently have a grant three that we uh, applied for that the state is still looking at funding um, to what amount we are not sure yet because we haven't been awarded anything. But we do have another grant request in. Um, hopefully we'll get some money and then the city will have to figure out how we're gonna fund the remaining portion of that project uh, in order to get it done. But it is moving forward. Um, we're, we're almost there. We're almost there. Do we have any idea at all when we would know about grant three? I know everything's nope. does. I don't know. I mean, that's, I, I know the mayor and our service, uh, safety service director have been hounding um, the Mannings as sure. well as uh, any of our other state officials that are in control of those budgets. Um, but no, I, we have no idea when they'll come out. It should happen before the end of the year. Great. Great news. And that concludes my presentation. That's just the discussion. It didn't say we were getting anything. <laughs> I'll take information. Does, uh, does, does anybody want to go back and talk about anything in particular on the capital improvements projects? My question for you, do you think the hydro replacing we're still okay with the server stuff was in here earlier and they're doing everything in-house this year. So they're about 85% um, functionality, I think they said, and we're going to um, and it looks like we're going to put more money into it in 2022. Do you feel we're okay with our fire hydrants? Are they yeah, right at this point, I think we're fine. I mean, I haven't heard of one come across that a fire has gone to and they haven't been able to use it. So I think when that becomes readily an issue, then we're having an issue. But at this point in time, I've never heard of a fire our fire department has gone to a hydrant and it's not worked. So I know, I know we had to them last couple of years and the correct. I know we've had, to, you know, obviously we need to do some replacements, but um, I don't think we're in a position that we're not safe. Any other 
questions? One question for you too. It's um, the extension of Waterbury from uh, Sugar Ridge to Chestnut. Is there any further thoughts on that? Because that is a hot topic in that particular neighborhood. Yeah, at this point, um, you know, we base our extensions, those roadway extensions, on development. Um, that road was paid for by development, um, put in by the developer. If there is a sale of land and a developer buys that and decides to, you know, as obviously as part of their development process, they will extend that road. Um, but at this point, we don't know of anybody interested in extending that to the south. Um, as a city, I mean, I don't really see any need for us to do it at this point. We've, in the past, we have uh, allowed developers to be able to fund these projects for us. Um, so at this point, there's not really a need for us to extend that. If you know the community, you can jump over to Victoria and get out to Chestnut just the same. Um, at this point, there's no real need for the city to do it. Don't get me wrong, they don't want it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I believe that it won't happen until a developer comes along and purchases that land, if that ever happens. Um, but again, that timetable is who knows. So in other words, the way I've been informing them, I've been accurate. We're waiting for a developer. It's a, and there's nobody accurate. in sight right now. At this point, there's nobody in sight. And a lot, um, some of that land, it's owned by a multitude of different owners. There's a couple of different owners in there. So, one one's will, a, will not sell willingly. Yeah, one's a trust, and one will not sell willingly. So, who knows when that over that would happen? I, I don't have an idea. I'd, I'd like to throw this caveat out though. But if you had a someone that wanted to take 160 acres of that industrial land back there, and part of that was negotiating putting a road in to get to Route 10, I certainly, as a taxpayer and as a safety service director, would support that if we could get several hundred jobs back in that area. I, I definitely agree with the safety service director. It will all be development-based. I'm not necessarily opposed to that either, so. Any other questions? Well, thanks everybody. If you have any questions that you didn't think of now, send me an email or something and uh, give me a call. I'll be definitely I want to answer them. Christina, did I miss anyone? Yeah. Thanks, guys. Uh, or Christina. Christina is well aware of our budget. She knows uh, everything just as I do inside and out, so she'll be able to help as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs> lunch. I think we'll recess. Our next one isn't uh, due until 12. And so we'll recess until that point. And my understanding is lunch will be provided in the office and uh, go from there.
No Zoom? Nobody on Zoom? No, oh, I only have a live to YouTube. No Zoom access. Oh, I'm sorry. YouTube? Nope. Zoom access. Yeah. 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 Thank you all for having me up here. The, uh, the French Creek plant is pretty much, as it stands right now, we're dominated mostly by upgrades and renovations to seven major systems we have out there. So for the most part, our salaries and personnel have been falling over the years. And, um, there have been efficiencies to all the new equipment that we put in. So the main operations and maintenance budget has not seen uh, a lot of growth. Really, the growth has come in the capital projects that we have, which are very, very large capital projects. Um, <laughs> just if that's, I could... Corey, that's an understatement. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's what dominates us. Now, as, as we get through all of these systems, which I anticipate will be somewhere in the 2024, 2025 range, it should level off. The systems that we design normally have, some of the equipment has a 15 to 25 year lifespan, but some of the large infrastructure like tanks and the concrete, that has 50 to 75 years of a lifespan. So it's, we're mostly just, just upgrading the process equipment that sits inside the building. And you'll do that about every 25 to 35 years. On some of this equipment, like the sand filter project we're in right now, which is a $5.4 million project that we're right in the middle of, it's the filter upgrade project. Those filters were original, so they were put in 76, so we've got more than enough the useful life on those. But for the most part, what we're doing is we move from project to project, and uh, that dominates a lot of the budget and a lot of the debt. And it, it really is the driver for any rate increases. And that should level off come 2025. And um, we'll get a lull from all that. As for operations and maintenance, there's not much difference. We did make a few changes. We had some retirements. We shuffled some, some managing people around, uh, redistributed some work among the managers. Uh, we have quasi-working managers out there. They're, they're all former operators and maintenance guys. So we work. We all work hand in hand with the with those staff, the union staff. Um, one large change is that we've been we've been working a lot on how we handle sludge management out at French Creek, trying to develop a way to be a little more flexible in how we store and remove sludge and um, there's going to be a, a, an upcoming cost not only with our, our hauling provider quasar but also we're going to be building a large super hut which will allow for at least three months of storage dry storage of sludge and right now what we do is we haul sludge out daily in truck beds that daily rigor of having a truck driver come and drop come and drop come and drop every day is costly uh, under the new method that we're going to develop, we're going to stockpile, we're going to send a fleet of trucks exactly when the farm fields can accept it. So when the farm fields want 30 trucks, we can give them 30 trucks, not just one a day. So there's going to be some efficiencies there, although there's going to be an upfront cost in 2021 to kind of make the conversion over to, to doing that. But it will definitely pay dividends in the long run, make us more flexible and much more efficient in how we handle sludge. So you'll see an increase in, in the capital side for the super hush, the 250,000 product, and then in the operations and maintenance slides, you'll see that our sludge hauling costs are going up. Um, other than that, we've gotten pretty, pretty efficient. Right now we have two maintenance guys, one helper and one all around maintenance guy who knows all the electrical and everything in the plant. And um, what we've done is we've kept in house all of the maintenance that we can do 
fast and efficiently. And then we've gone with service contracts to some of our vendors who provide the equipment to maintain things. So for instance, our UV system has not had any issues in five years because Weatherco takes care of it. So we, they come in twice a year, we follow their exact maintenance program. And this equipment is in very, very good shape. And um, it, runs, it runs really well. What we used to do is we would try to take care of all this equipment with specialized pieces. And our guys would have to get equipment, they'd have to get go over the, the learning curve of working on a piece of equipment that, that breaks occasionally and is kind of complex. So right now we're sticking with all the stuff we do well and we're uh, letting the uh, equipment providers service the equipment. And that's worked out really, really good. Uh, it's, it's increased the uptime and uh, for all the equipment and taking some burden off for us to do things that, that we can do really well. Other than that, like I said, the operations and maintenance line items are all pretty much uh, in line or reduced with what they were in 2019. Uh, we have, uh, and I talked to April about this, I believe that every year I've been here, the budget format or configuration of accounts has changed. So it's gotten really hard to go from one year to year like this account is trending up and this account is trending down. We're always moving things around, but some of them are the same, like percentas or uh, the salary brackets are all the same. So you can tell how much everyone's getting paid from year to year, but the um, overall, you have to look at the bottom line number and say which direction are we trending instead of the individual accounts. And I think we're pretty flat on operations and maintenance and, and of course, we're spending a lot of money on the capital side. Well, one other capital project that's going to drive a big increase next year is the new screening units. The screening units have flooded at least 30 times since they were put in. And each time it can range anywhere from thirty to $80,000 in repairs and labor when, uh, when the screens break. The screens are down on the first floor right where all the uh, raw water comes in. They've been down there uh, since the late 80s, and uh, they can, this year they flooded twice. So one other project we're doing coming up in 2021 is we're moving the screens up to the fourth floor, and we're moving everything out of the wet well, which is four stories deep. Some of you have been out there, four stories down. So we're moving everything above what we think is the highest flood level we've seen, which is 34 feet. So... Uh, that should that should be a good long term fix for our so that the equipment down there does not continue to flood. And every time it floods, it's just it, it, the manpower it takes and the equipment cost for the new motors is is uh, cost us a lot more than uh, than we're going to spend on moving them up to the first floor over the years. So that's a big project for next year. That's going to increase efficiency and safety. So we're bringing uh, the rag compactors up to the first floor. And uh, so all the screening is coming up. So that one, the super hut, and uh, the continuation of the $5.4 million filter project are the three dominant projects for next year. Um, we've got a whole bunch of little ones going on. A lot of these smaller projects we do in-house, we move things around for efficiency, we change tank locations, we change piping uh, to better locations that make sense and are more efficient. So we're always doing little things like that, but um, those projects are all in the O&M budget and usually under maintenance materials. But um, when all electric plants, our electricity cost is, is, is a pretty expensive one. Uh, is a, a line item, 700 or some thousand, but let me jump in there. Because it is such a big expense, we did investigate the use of uh, solar panels out there. And we had the electric company take a look at that and they did a study and basically said, it's not worth it yet. Uh, we do have a lot of land out there, so we could put a pretty big solar farm out there, but uh, the cost benefit isn't there at this point in time. Just so you know. An ROI, that's probably 10, 15 years, maybe, if you're lucky. Just, yeah. 
we have a balanced staff in hand. Um, now that President Biden's in, maybe they'll throw all sorts of money around in that area and we'll have a different look at it. Clean energy grants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, the problem is we didn't support it. Well, yeah, he's still going to throw that money around with that new Green Deal thing going on. So. <laughs> But with that, I'll I'll, I'll have, take any questions that you'd like to bring me to answer, or if you want me to detail out anything, uh, or I could just keep going if you prefer. Or did you want to talk about the equipment, the equipment replacement schedule? It's the first document I gave you. Yes, the um, on the equipment replacement schedule, we're going to add one more truck next year, which is the uh, F one fifty quad cab. And um, we're going to mothball when it's appropriate to get rid of a, a 2003 Durango. And um, so we're going to add that. We're going to, as part of that, the sludge management redo and, and becoming a little bit more independent in how we manage our sludge and not relying as much on Quasar from a scheduling standpoint, we're going to buy a, a, a new single axle dump for moving sludge internally in the plant. And um, our most important purchase is gonna be the cat front end loader, which has a scale on it. So when you're hauling out of the plant, we, if we can load our trucks, if we can produce the driest sludge we can, that means there's no water in it, or at least amount of water as possible. And then we can load these trucks to exactly their limit of 24 tons. It's a new cat loader. Every time it takes a scoop and dumps it, it will tell you how much it's putting into the truck. That will increase our efficiency dramatically. We believe that we could get it down from an average of 20 trucks a month down to 15 trucks. So that's five less trucks hauling to month. It's, it's uh, over time, it's really gonna, gonna help. So the cat loader is an important part of that. Um, the equipment purchases for the Ferris tanks, when I, when I mentioned earlier about we're always moving things around to make them more efficient, there's a, uh, the Ferris tanks, the way they built this plant, they would put in central, centrally located um, systems, and then if they needed to, they would just pump it all over our, you know, 40 acres. Well, now we, we situate the, the tanks and the processes right next to the the system of the process that it supports. So we're gonna be moving our Ferris tanks instead of a, I think the total piping run was 330 feet. It's gonna be a, a 20 foot run. So we're gonna move the tanks closer to where they inject the Ferris into the process. We're also gonna pick up a back truck from the street department, which we've been wanting for a while. We borrow theirs all the time. We use their jetters and we use their, their um, the suction on the back trucks to clean out our tanks. So uh, we're going to uh, purchase their used one, which we've used a lot. Keep it in good shape. If they ever need it, it'll be a backup for the city as well while we're, while we're housing it out in our place and using it. And uh, also there's gonna be another pump, high efficiency pump going in. It's called the RAS pump, the return activated sludge pump. We've been converting over the old pumps and technologies to one, it's just like everything else, like your car's better than your 1970, you know, Cornet. We basically, we have a lot of 1970 Cornets out there. And so we're upgrading them and uh, they're much quieter, much better, more efficient pumps. So that's the equipment replacement schedule. I also see on here an F-250, is it also included? Well, I thought that was, that's an existing. The first F-250 yeah. is a current lease okay. that he has, and the 2021 would be an additional. Yeah. Right, and, and when we met uh, last Wednesday, Wednesday uh, Corey, there were some questions about why he needed the F-150 quad cap. Yeah, we, well, what we did was, under order to wheelchair, we started getting rid of all of our old vehicles and getting newer ones. And um, we requested the quad cab because we have no, all of our other trucks are, are uh, single cab. So we requested the quad cab to, 
to give us a vehicle that not only not only will function in plant, but we can also take on trips. You go to seminars and things of that nature. So that'll be our only real multi-person vehicle. Uh, all the rest of them are just single cab. And they're dump trucks and utility trucks. Uh, this will be the only one that can haul multiple people. Rumors are for expansion at French Creek. If we were to bring on more cities or more customers, or how much room do we have? Or how, how much are we using of our current facility? We're only using about 50 to 60 percent. Now, we it, within that 50 to 60 percent with new technology, like the three filters we're putting in take up a third of the building, whereas the old technology took up two thirds of that same building. And we get six more guilt, million gallons of capacity in that same space. So we could squeeze with, with newer technology into the existing plant layout more capacity. And then if we had to, we could spill over into the acreage that we have to the south and now some acreage to the back where the sand beds are. So we have quite a bit of room for expansion with with the, with the current designs we have. How many millions of gallons are we servicing on an average a day? Around six. Around six. What was, who would max out and how much room do we have to grow? Uh, on that physical footprint? Yeah, like would we do 10 or more? Oh, you, uh, if you've got the engineers and we really brainstorming out, you could probably put uh, 40, 50, 60 million, million gallon a day plant on that site. Yeah. You could, there's a lot of there's enough room for that. The current, let's just say the the concrete, of the hard structure that was built uh, was built to accept 33 million, but you didn't. Instead of all the pumps you would need to pump that, they only put in enough to pump six million. You know what they needed at the time. Sure. So, but the way it would be designed now would be completely different. Yeah much more compact, much more uh, ability to put more flow through on a smaller footprint. So I, I would say at least 40, 50 billion. Actually, we made a pitch, Kevin and I, before COVID hit with uh, the new mayor of Lorraine, and that's how we got Corey through. Lorraine was seeing what they can do with their Black River Landing plant. And they did what a year and a half of study. Yeah, it was a big study. Then through that process, it was it was found that French Creek and uh, what are the, one of the Lorraine plants. French Creek, and the main Black River plant. Uh, there was there were two areas that, that were looked at: the RTI or old steel mill site, which we had owned and were rehabbing, and French Creek. And the French Creek, in the analysis, came out to be more efficient and cheaper to go to. Hmm. We could actually send a cell, I mean, save the Lorraine residents millions of dollars right now. Hmm. But politics is getting in the way. Sure. Well, and that's a long-term, you know, uh, <laughs> effort that will have to be undertaken yeah. in order for that to happen. And, uh, and there will be some political issues that will cause some problems, but, uh, you know, it does make sense for them. First of all, it frees up their waterfront. You know, they have a, a treatment plant right on their, their waterfront, which is kind of dumb when you think about it. Uh, you know, there is a, a, an idea from the, the new mayor there in Lorraine that he would like to develop their waterfront. So, uh, you know, it would meet their needs for development. It would meet, you know, the need to get that plant out of there. Uh, would reduce their costs overall. We have the space. It would help us reduce our costs per person by bringing in extra people. So it, there's a lot of good reasons for it to happen. It's just, it might take a while for it to happen. We'll keep trying along the way and see what we can work out. But, um, you know, there's, uh, there's some union issues. There's two different unions operating at both plants and so you know there's a fear of people losing jobs and all that that goes into it as well so 
we'll see. It, it's something that we're investigating. I was wondering about the expansion just because it's, it's a great asset to have. And sure. um, if we have the ability to bring on other cities, and, and what cities do we service now? Avon, Sheffield Village, and Goldridgeville. Okay. I mean, yeah, if we can bring on more and more revenue. Actually, the study went so far as to say that French Creek and the Marine plant could come, could take care of the entire county. Wow. Yeah. They, have, they have two in the range. Gotcha. When the plant was originally conceived, and it be designed began in the 1970s, the Clean Water Act only came around after 69, 70. So there wasn't a whole bunch of focus on this, even before this plant was built. It was just in its fledgling thought. And they, never really anticipated the reduction in water usage and separation of storm and water in new houses. So the amount of water that's sent to a plant is a lot, a lot less now than it was in the 70s. And uh, so that same physical space that they designed can now handle much more capacity than it could have under the old you know, scheme of how they did it prior to basically 71. And that would include Elyria too. They would shut their plant down. And Avon Lake shut their plant down. Mm -hmm. So the only two plants would be left would be Lorraine's plant and our plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had regional discussions. We invited everybody. And uh, because even if you, you know, two people may find the opportunity right now to come together or a third one may, may come in later. You know, So we wanted everybody to, to think about that and uh, to plan for it. And uh, it's still hanging out there. Just a curious question too. How do, how do we rate compared to other cities or other states as far as our quality of water? Well, our quality of water is based on our NPDES permit. So we, we send out excellent quality water uh, in, in regard to, uh, and because we're on a smaller tributary, so you have the Black River, then you have the French Creek, then you have the lake. So the lowest discharge limits, let's just say ammonia, phosphorus, the Black River plant, which pumps into the lake, they can, their pollutant levels can be a little bit, a lot higher than ours that are on the upper tributaries. Because the tributaries are smaller, they can't handle as much loading of the pollutants. So our water and our uh, NPDES limitations are some of the strictest in the state. And uh, for instance, our phosphorus and our mercury level, I don't think there's anybody that has lower levels than we do. So we, we meet those and, um, you know, it's, it's pretty good water. What, um, what type of security measures are, are put into place just in case of potential terrorist activity or, I mean, it's, it's an area that could be impacted with, with the wrong thing happening. Well, we've been discussing it. Um, we have gates, we have an automatic gate, but, uh, and we're completely fenced and enclosed, but that's not foolproof. Uh, we're in the process right now of examining our cyber threat, which we're working with an outside vendor and seeking proposals to have them test. We have our Wi-Fi, our network, our SCADA, and our equipment, which all have computers on them. PLCs are computers. They can be hacked as well. And uh, our phone system. These are all the servers and, and, and things that function. So we're in the process of, of soliciting for, for uh, proposals to, to have them take a look at that. They, they look at your vulnerabilities. In fact, the American uh, Water Infrastructure Act has a section, I think it's 213, on uh, risk and resiliency for all water and wastewater plants. And it, it gives you a, a list of things that you have to look for and uh, test for. So there's a lot of consultants out there that have read that act and now are offering to, to do those stress tests of your system. Or your camera coverage. Yeah, we have 48 cameras, by the way. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and, and they're, not, they're not only for, you know, to find out who's doing what, but it's also, a lot of these are focused on key pieces of equipment so that you can, you can see the well well flooding, you can see the tanks, if they have an alarm, you can, you can visually see things without having to leave. Do you have remote access to those cameras? Yeah, you know, we could get on to the, to, uh, we have a VPN, which is a security feature. Uh, so we can get it out through iPads or computer logins and actually control most of the plan. And um, 
That's another vulnerability that we look at. So, so far, I'm the only one that normally does that. But um, if I can get in, there's a pathway for somebody else as well. What about staffing? How are you on personnel? Well, we've been <coughs> decreasing staffing over the years as things have gotten a little more efficient. I think we've kind of reached our, our point where um, you know, we interject overtime when we can to you know to fill the high spots. I think most most companies in the private sector do that. They don't hire home new staff; they just peak up and down with overtime during the hard times. Um, this year, uh, it's we haven't been hit by COVID, so we've had pretty much a full staff. But we're looking to hire a maintenance mechanic. We need a, as our as our main backup to. Um, to Scott, who's our main, our main maintenance guy, who does everything. And that would bring us up to 16. And then we'll assess from there whether some of our operators' positions need to be filled. But I, I think uh, 17 might be a, a healthy number. We seem to be pretty good there. Uh, we have to have two men on a shift, two people on a shift, for safety and for other operational reasons. So, um, we're, we're handling it now, but we're, we're, at the, we're at the lean edge of where we want to be. I know just in the past, there's all types of different certifications and degrees that are required to, to work there. Um, did you build in any, anything into the budget as far as for a person for additional training or additional? Yeah, we, we, have, um, we have a section up there at the top for uh, member education, travel and transportation, probably with the quad caps for We're always training our guys. We, each of them have uh, anyone with a license has a requirement from Ohio EPA to make to get certain CEUs and um, I do some teaching of that work it's, it's a constant constant learning process with the certifications uh, a year years ago we decided to uh, Jeff and I had a lot of conversations about this of going only after licensed personnel that's not to say we won't build someone internally to get a license but um, if, we, if we know of a good licensed person out there, we try to get them. And uh, you've already kind of seen how they work and you know that they've achieved a certain level. So we try to recruit when we can. And um, the licensing, or cert well, I shouldn't say it's licensing, certification is what we look for. Thank you. That's all I have. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about the historical the employees coming out. Yeah, we, we um, I think when I started here in 2013, I think there were 21, 22 employees. So we're down to 15. And um, as we've outsourced the, some things that we could, that were better off for others to do, and we've maximized our own efficiencies in, internally, um, we can now you know, get away with, with fewer staff. When, when these plants were built in the seventies, it was, there was a large manual component. I mean, the tank had to be cleaned by five guys climbing in there, not by a, not by a vector truck pulling up to the edge and sucking it out. So those kinds of things have led to us being able to staff a little bit less, but we have been fortunate in a couple of ways. Um, one, one thing is from our management team down, almost everybody can operate. So there's a lot of filling in if something, somebody goes down. We've also never had a catastrophic loss of a lot of people. We were not hit by COVID. We probably will be tomorrow. <laughs> but so far, we have not had any devastating losses of personnel. And, um, everybody's cross-trained in a plant. So, uh, Almost anyone can operate except the secretaries. So it has trended down over the years. But I think we're still in a healthy, healthy amount. And quite frankly, that says a lot about your operation because my understanding is that the virus is going direct to our wastewater treatment plants. Yeah, it's coming in in the flow, along with every other virus and bacteria that comes out of the pipe. Um, you probably have the antibody. We we might. You know, <laughs> I, I, I look, so, You're immune to it. When I was the utilities director, the rate I was at the remote office, 
when I did come to work for Fred Street, I was sick for about the first year on and off. I didn't do it. So there's never been an official test, but it is thought that over time we may build up immunity to some of those things just from being in that environment. I'd hate to think that because that means we're exposed, but it's in the air out there. It's everywhere. So we'll see. Um, none, I haven't, none of us have been tested, so I don't know. But it is coming down the pipe. But well, we have had some offers to, and we probably will in 2021 begin to test the wastewater for COVID levels. Um, IDEX, which is our main lab testing facility for E. coli bacteria for the EPA, they have a rapid test. And um, our outside supplemental lab that helps us is gearing up for 2021 testing. And it's not going to be that expensive either. Either I'm amazed at how cheap the test is. It's at like 100 bucks or something. And uh, they can give you levels of COVID in the wastewater. So hopefully. Is that before it's treated or after? No, that's before. Yeah. After, when it heads out past the UV, it's such a hostile environment inside the, you know, the, the, the virus likes 98.6 degrees. It likes no oxygen. Uh, one of the things that we do at the plant you see bubbling is uh, the called aeration zones. Because in your body, there's not a lot of free oxygen. It likes, you know, bacteria get in there and viruses. And they do not like to be exposed to an oxidant, like oxygen. So when, we, when it goes through the process of aerating in the sewers or aerating in our plant, that process alone and the temperature changes normally knock out any human pathogens that um, like the human body, because that's not a hospitable place for one of those. We grow, we grow a separate set of bacteria cultures that um, they would make you sick, but they like it in the tanks. So we, we let the, the bacteria we like eat up all the ones that are coming in. And that's, that's basically what a treatment plant does. And then we hit it with the UV on the way out. We filter it and then hit it with UV. So. Are those little bugs? The, well, there's, they're actually, if you, if you take a cornflake and you put rod-shaped bacteria, they're called flock, it's the bacteria that do 99.9% of the work in a uh, wastewater treatment. It's all about bacteria eating up what, what comes in that field. So I'm really running a, a huge Petri dish out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a toilet. Toilet. Yeah. Giant septic system. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the littlest guys do the most work out there. Now, Corey, you uh, were the screens were those were, were getting damaged by the high water levels we, yeah. we experienced this last year a couple of times. And part of this, part of this, just so I understand, I think it, I do is that so we're going to raise those to a level where they're not going to keep getting damaged by these, you know, uh, higher than normal water. Uh, Levels we saw a couple times this year. Yes, four stories up. So what's it's... the highest it went this year? So the highest we measured on the wall was 34 feet from normal seven foot depth level. So we have a wet well. Seven foot normal normally is the depth. It'll go up and down, and then it raised up to 34 feet. And it's a it's a huge concrete bunker. I don't know how many of you have been out there to see it, but the flow goes under the floor and then the whole concrete bunker fills with water and it's meant to do that. So putting any equipment down there, you're almost guaranteeing it's going to flood. So we've moved all the equipment above the 34 foot known flood level and uh, up to the top. Thank you. Has anybody not gone out there? Holly, you need to go. <laughs> well, I wanted to, but you know, COVID. So we'll take you out there. It's COVID free. <laughs> <laughs> you just said that. <laughs> Except the water, right? Yeah, just don't drink the water. <laughs> <laughs> now, when COVID's over with, we'll take you out. It's getting cold out there now. Yeah. I like the place. Everybody. Okay, maybe turn on the toilet. I guess that's it, Corey. That's all your time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome.
Bruce, are you okay with the pick department to just keep this rolling? Yeah, he's a bunch. My brakes wired.
Okay, finance committee meeting. Good night, sir. Chief Freeman, welcome. Thank you, sir. And I'm sorry, I'll let you introduce your uh, partner there. Captain Jones. And if you want to go through and explain. Yeah, we basically were able, um, per the auditor's request, to try to employ 2018-2019 numbers, those things that I could control. Um, obviously, we were able to do that. Um, those parameters that she set. Um, the only other thing outside of the those particular line items were cruisers. And this year, the cruiser expenditure, because we're allowed, we're able to use um, some of the old components from some of the older vehicles, computers, what have you, we're actually coming in $5,000 less than we had the request from last year. Um, so in a nutshell, we were able to keep the, the 2021 numbers at 2019 levels. Uh, per the request, and like I said, the cruisers actually came, the cruisers are actually more expensive per se. The equipment that the equipment that we like I say we were able to supplement the one we're going to be able to get rid of um, to put them into the new. So actually, that becomes a little bit cheaper. Um, than the extra number of the year. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> In 2021, you are requesting an additional patrolman. Did you want to talk about your idea on that? Yes. Uh, thank you for bringing it up. We are requesting uh, an extra patrolman because what we would like to do is create a traffic bureau. Um, as you know, the number one complaint in the city is traffic, traffic, traffic. Um, what we could do is employ a unit that all they deal with is traffic, traffic, traffic. Uh, we currently have one guy assigned to the traffic unit. Um, and his productivity has been outstanding. Um, where uh, a council person calls, say, Hey, this street has been problematic besides Sugar Ridge. We do our best on Sugar Ridge, but um, we are able to take that officer because he doesn't have call requirements and can send him down into that neighborhood. We can sit and hopefully eliminate problems. Or a lot of neighbors say this one particular vehicle. So once we stop that one particular vehicle, obviously uh, we can move on. Uh, but these traffic cars, what they can do is work 24 hours. Well, 1765, but they were they will work a modified shift where they're not in the patrol um, caveat of taking calls so we can send them down the problematic areas. Okay. Yeah. Would that officer require any it, it's the same training the other officers have already currently? Yes. And would you be requiring an additional uh, vehicle or unit for that individual no. as well? No. no. Well, you would Technically, no, because what we do is there's no support car function anymore. Um, support car function, we are phasing out over a period of time. So everything, anybody that gets hired new, they're not in a take-home car anymore because we're phasing that program out. So they would just be stuck in a unit with somebody else. Okay. Thank you. Earlier, we had uh, the uh, service department here you know, gave us some estimate on some signs, speed signs. Um, similar to the ones that are in Avon, um, how with the, with the traffic we all start, which I think is a great idea. Um, would those signs go directly to that information funnel to you guys, with, depending on the type of sign that it is, and are those useful and helpful for you? We, for used, to have, we used to have a contraption we used to put up on telephone poles, and this calls called a spell stat. <laughs> um, for example, down on Avalon, we put it down on Avalon numerous times. It does give you data, which either confirms or refutes what a, neighbor, a neighborhood is complaining. It'll give you the number of cars. So we still have that unit. Now, if those signs can do that, have that capability, where there's data associated with it, that would be helpful. Chief, in addition to the, the new officers you're looking to hire, uh, do you have any officers that are ready to retire in the next year? Not next year. Um, we talked to the mayor about this. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the drop program through the Ohio Police Fire and Pension. An officer can go eight additional years, leave, 
we're going to have a window probably in the next four to eight years where I would say at least a third of the department will be leaving because you have to leave or you're penalized through that pension program. Um, so I would say at least a third, if not more, will be leaving during that duration. But next year we won't have any, I believe the captain is the next in three years. Yeah. January 24. But after that, we're going to, have to do some planning where we don't no, have. I said not as like he's counting it down. Right. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit about the K9 program? Like how many how many K9 do we have now? And uh, yes, currently, currently we have one on each shift. Um, uh, the training, obviously, most of these uh, animals were purchased with donations. The last two were, um, like I said, they train constantly. Um, no, it's it's been ideal. Yeah. Um, I don't know where you want. I just want to know where we're at. Do we need to appropriate, appropriate money for no, we're good. dogs? Or? No, we're, we're good right now. The dogs all are within the age of still working. Um, vehicles actually, the fourth canine car was purchased new last year. So all four canine cars are relatively new with not thousands of thousands of miles on them. So no, we're in real good shape as far as the canine program goes. How long do we keep a dog at service? Um, you can probably speak to that in eight, nine, 10 years. Um, if you get 10 years out of it, you're, you're doing pretty well. Seven is probably the average, obviously injuries, things like that. We're just like people, obviously back problems, arthritis, sure. uh, things of that nature. But one of the great parts of this program, um, the vet here in the city up on Stony, he gives us free health care. Uh, everything we manage through them is free. Um, so we were able to actually drop the insurance on the dogs because obviously the surgery or things like that, they'll pick up the total bill. So we have a very good working relationship with the vet. And uh, so it's worked out real well. That's awesome. We talked about in the past too, we need appropriate money for like drug task enforcement. Is it the hell's that going? Is it getting better? I mean, or, or where are we at with that? Um, overdoses are still obviously occurring. Um, we just got a, a grant from the Lorain County Prosecutor Office to buy some surveillance equipment that we weren't able to afford on our own. Um, so that should help where actually you can, um, we got some surveillance equipment that will help. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, okay. That's very big. I was going to put some backyard. Yeah, that was wrong. I'm going back there in a bucket. Oh, my God. I know it was safe. <laughs> but no, that, that's going well. Uh, and currently, we have one guy in the DB. The majority of what he does is that. So we almost have, he's not exclusive, but the majority of the work he does is that. And we currently have, what, two resource officers for the, for the school? We do, but with the modified schedule, we are only currently with one because obviously they're all using the same building. Um, so we do have two assigned, but the high school guy only goes on Wednesdays. The grade school guys go Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And when they're not being used at the school, they just go back into the road patrol function. So we wanted to keep the guy that was familiar with the high school students in the high school, the guy that was familiar with elementary kids in elementary school. Thank you. And if they go back to a full-time system, they would be both back into the school. But there's another program where we've worked it out with the school where it's a 50-50 cut. For every day they're in school, they're picking up half a tab. So the city's paying for half a tab when they're in school, and the school picks up the other 50% for the days they're actually working inside the school. As far as the uh, police facility right now, um, How's it withstanding time? I mean, are you guys able to get by or is it, is it really bad? From 25 years into a five year temporary building. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, the jail's in good shape. I mean, yeah, there's in, in general, why don't you just talk about the drawing that you got put together? And yes, we did get an architect, and uh, the architect, um, we had a lot of ideas how we want this new facility to look based upon our past experience inside the current building. Um, so we actually have. We didn't want to spend a whole heck of a lot of money coming up with some type of uh, architectural drawing that might sit on the shelf for the, the next 20 years if the grace, if the citizen enough give you the grace to build another one. So I didn't want to spend on a full-blown plan 
So we spent in the neighborhood, I believe it was like five to $7,000 to just get an idea of what the facility would look like, okay. where it would be on that plot of land over by the fire department without spending a lot of tax dollars, where people get a good preconceived notion uh, of where it's going to be, what it may look like without spending a lot of money. Sure. Um, right now, we are out of space. Um, you said it the best. I mean, 25 the, years into a five year temporary fix. Right. Yeah, my yeah. daughter was born when you guys were stuck in the temporary spot. Right. <laughs> um, and the thing is, the building is used hard because it's a 24 7 operation. So it gets used around the clock and things just start to fall apart. Um, now, I don't want to obviously, if the next people who use the building, <laughs> obviously, I don't want to make it sound like it's dismal doom because obviously other people. Are maybe working in that facility. Mm -hmm. It yeah. needs it needs some serious work. But I think the, the building is tired from being a twenty four seven operation. I know when we talked last year, there was uh, some things that were being done to address communications between officers. How has that improved, or where are we at with that? As far as radio systems go, correct. Um, we're still currently on the radio system we built uh, approximately five years ago. Um, it has helped. We put another repeater on the tower at nine one one. Which is off of Burns Road, because our biggest problem was to the north. Um, that has seemed to take away some of the issues. Any radio system, if you know anything about radios, atmospheric conditions can cause radios to be problematic. Um, are there still places where we get static? Yes. Are we in a basement or we're in a concrete building? We still have issues, but by putting that repeater up on the 911 tower, it, it has helped. And uh, 911 was gracious enough to. Basically, all we need to do is just put another police radio up there. They allowed us to go up on their tower with their cabling and everything else. So it was a very minimal cost to do that. But it's, it's helped. I know in the past, too, there was also a specific request for additional vests. Is that still something that's... Or, or What we do, we have a governmental program. It's a 50-50 split with the federal government. Okay. Um, every five years, a vest is considered... Um, Void. Okay. I don't personally believe that, but it is what it is. But every year, every five years, that guy will get a new vest. Uh, it's purchased through the city. We sent 50% request into the federal government, and we get that 50% back. So it's a 50 50 split that we're current. That's obviously something that we try to stay up on. Great. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, the other question I would have. And I've, I've gotten it from a couple of high profile residents. And that really pertains to their limits as far as when they run into a, a, a particular problem and as far as how much force they're allowed to use. Has the police department set up any kind of guidelines for our citizens? That's called the Ohio Vice Code. Obviously, the Ohio Vice Code establishes guidelines what force you can use and what force you can't. Um, because the best of my knowledge, no disrespect, uh, but Mr. Evans, what does this have to do with the budget? Well, it may affect uh, any uh, personnel time in order to develop any kind of plan. It's a higher vice code. In other words, they can't use any more force than anybody, any other uh, American. In other words, they have no, they have no authority to use force against somebody else. They have no. They have no right to harass people. They have no right to follow people. What they're doing is it hinges on illegal. Hinges. And, and they've been told numerous times to stop and desist. But one of these days, obviously, people don't know who they are, or but I don't see how this has to do anything with the budget. Well, you may have to, uh, to you may have to uh, have some personnel to establish any type of uh, response that citizens are requesting. And I'm, and I'm responsible for that. I, I take care of all policy procedure, but the Ohio Vice Code is pretty clear in what they can and can't do. Thank you. That additional question. Um, you said that the program where the officers take their car home is, is no longer in play. It, it's, it's being phased out over time. Okay. In other words. Um, it was a program when I started here as a chief of police. Mm -hmm. um, what what you're seeing is probably in the last 
seven to eight years. Um, it's very it's very hard to maintain a fleet of the size because obviously every time they change a vehicle, everything inside changes. So you're just not buying police cruisers. You're buying computers. You're buying gun racks. You're buying light bars. So over time, it is going to be phased out. Um, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. But yes, probably within the last five to seven years, people who come on the department, there is no support car program okay. any longer. So they drive their own vehicle here? Correct. They Correct. Use the police car and drive their own vehicle. Now, is there value to the support car program? Yes. But once again, you're talking about dollars and cents. Sure. In other words, um, is the is the what we're getting out of it worth the cost? And the thing is, cruisers aren't what I what they were when I started. You know, you basically had the siren in the end. Top. <laughs> <laughs> but the equipment inside a police cruiser, you buy a police cruiser for thirty thousand dollars. By the time you get it out on the road, you're talking about forty seven, forty eight thousand dollars. Yeah. So that's that's the complexity. The more cars you have, the more cars you have to outfit. And where does the cost on the return come into play? Sure. Now, does each officer have his own laptop? Is that how it works? When he gets into a car, he just... He does. It, it's, it's in the car. Okay. He starts. In other words, the laptop remains in the car. The gun rack remains in the car. Um, so he just gets in. Basically, all he's doing is taking his go bag, his go bag, putting it on the passenger seat, locking it in place, and he's he's off and rolling. Where the other guy takes it out on his days off or he puts it in the trunk or what have you. Sure. So the, the car just stays outfitted. I can get in there right now and do my work but yes gotcha okay yeah i know it's, it's for it to be call, cost effective and save money i get it i always liked knowing though that in my neighborhood there's two police officers cars sitting no, there it is. So, that's what you lose you yeah. lose um because what happens is obviously guys come in 10 till okay you get your stuff you know take your body camera off make sure your gear is put away okay you do lose that 10 minutes before and 10 minutes after those guys are going home we're coming in it does add some value, or we have a homicide or something important where somebody has to get somewhere. It's gonna they have to drive here, they gotta drive back to so you know that's not gonna change with the canine guys, the guys on the uh, multi-jurisdictional SWAT team, because the call out could be in Wellington. Mm -hmm. They have to drive here, then they had to drive out to Wellington when they live in Wellington, and they could be there in three minutes for sure. So uh, there's some variables, but for the most part, it's just too expensive. Sure. Yeah. I have a question on safety, though. It was canceled last year because of COVID, correct? Yes. So my understanding, they're allowing current kindergartners to go in next year with incoming kindergartners. Is that why there's an increase in the budget for that? No. Safety bill is self-funding. In other words, Oh, that's right. They recently changed that. Correct. Okay. Where safety bills are self-funding. If we have to have more sessions, usually the cost of safety bill will offset the cost that we have. Right. They did that recently, yes. I think they it was took it out from last the year. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so we're just going to have to have more sessions this year. Yeah. Hopefully. Well, and that's going to be more staffing time. And sure. Uh, Chief, you, you mentioned that through retirement, you're going to lose some staff over the next several years uh, from a staffing level now or the next year or two. Are there any concerns with bringing more people on to start filling, you know, they have enough pool to fill people leaving? Believe it or not, our last testing, we had 50 applicants, which was great. We were thinking we were going to have 10 to 15. Okay. Um, so we actually had 50 applicants and uh, um, there's some good people on the list. Um, now going forward, I, I don't know what the environment is going to be. Sure. I didn't think we were going to get 50 last time. Um, but you know, you're absolutely right. That could be problematic in the future. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I like Thank the you. fact that you guys really stayed within the lines and try to keep the budget the same and understanding the situation the city's in. And uh, you guys do a tremendous job and uh, to be able to keep maintaining that safety. You're one of the safest cities in the country.
country, if you ask me. And I, I really appreciate all that you guys do. It's a teamwork. It's, it's all about taking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just going downstairs to get guided. Okay. I agree. I think that's Sugar's Road, huh? What's that? Basically, I mentioned Sugar's Road. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I was going to be smart. I guess that's what the one officer were hiring is just for Sugar's Road. <laughs> but <laughs> I didn't have the guts. So. Building officer, thank you for coming. Yes, sir. And, uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, summarize at this point. No big surprises. We're not looking to purchase anything in the coming year. We're just trying to hold the line like we did last year to try and minimize costs. So it pretty much mirrors what we have done in 2020. Questions? <laughs> uh, an estimate on how many building permits we're going to have. Our residential building permits. We're already over 300 there. Like 305, something like that. That's, that's, that's how we start across the 300 plateau. So this is the third year in a row that. We've issued over 300 house permits. Are you allowed to at any point tell them no? No. No. And you can put temporary building moratoriums on there, but if somebody has land, and you deny them the right to use that land, then the city ends up buying it. That's what I've always been taught by the law department. Well, remember though that uh, most of the building permits are going in in subdivisions that were approved back in 2003. Oh, so, happened. you know, Waterbury, Metal Lakes specifically, those are the two bigger ones. That, that, yes, and, and those are rapidly coming to a close. Yeah, would you say uh, Metal Lakes and Waterbury are around 90% done or somewhere around there? Yes, sir. Um, um, Metal Lakes has got one more phase. Days. Right, and Waterbury has no more phases. They've completed not all the construction yet, but they've completed all their approvals for their plans. And I will add to uh, uh, moratoriums that have been taken to court and the city to keep on losing those moratoriums. So. Well, depending on what, what you may be trying to regulate, I mean, a lot of times they try and do a short-term moratorium 
which they can get away with to, to correct something or change something, but long term, no. If you deny them the right to use that property, the city ends up buying it or losing in court, one of the two. So after Wonder and Metal Lakes are finished, what's the next biggest? Hampton Place, Place, North Ridge North. Point. Um, you still have the tail end of Ridgefield. There's probably, I'm guessing, about 200 more homes to be built down there yet. But that's a very slow growth uh, community, has been for the last 20 years. Steady but, but slow. Mr. President, could you speak on your staffing levels right now? How is uh, how are you staffed? Do you have any open positions or how you like We have plenty of inspectors and we don't anticipate a need for any more. Great. Um, I have two older inspectors and I'm not anticipating retirement, but that looms in the future. As far as uh, have you allocated any money for additional training or for additional certifications within your budget? We, we pretty much have our education and we live within that. Um, um, this year, I don't think we, we uh, spent as much as, as we had because of the COVID-19. Usually my inspectors attend a joint conference once a year with, with all statewide inspectors, and that was canceled. Um, there's a lot of online stuff. Some of it's free, some of it's minimal cost, some of it's expensive. Uh, we try and avoid the expensive end of it unless it's absolutely necessary. The one organization puts on 10 hours of education for $50 for all certifications. You can't beat that. We try and take advantage of that. But it's not so much a cost saving measure as an education. In other words, it's great to get that, but are we getting an educational value for it as well? So we try and balance that. I've always been a big proponent of education for the building codes because there's changing all the time. Uh, what about the vehicles from the building department? What kind of shape are they in and is there any need there? They're 2017 leases and they all have less than 30,000 miles if I remember correctly. We just took the mileage uh, for the auditor's office. They're on five-year leases. Yes, thank you. Is there any other equipment that you would require? No. Well, if you're looking at the budget, it's really close to 2019. You did a great job. and. Uh, April did. I just said we're just right over here. <laughs> yeah, April. Nice, nicely done. Uh, All the department heads, you know, we, we've sharpened our pencils and tried to cut the budget as close as we could because of what's going on with the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all anticipate that's probably going to reflect into 2021. So we're trying to uh, do our part to help out. So you would say permitting this year is about the same as it was in 19? Yes, um, we actually, we saw more commercial this year than we did in 2019. Um, we were doing a lot of inspections in 19, but all of those were carryovers from permits we issued in 2018 to do nursing homes. Um, sure. Can't think of anything else, but the nursing homes were, were huge inspection items for us, but we issued those permits in 2018. Um, so we're starting to see a lot more commercial, Lorraine Road, um, Center Ridge Road, the car wash, the, uh, um, I'm sorry, the animal clinic over there is doing two good sized additions. We're doing two daycare centers. Um, we thought we would see drug mark coming this year, but um, it looks like they're not going to pull the trigger until the first part of next year, but they have bought the property. So we're seeing a lot more commercial and we anticipate a lot more commercial when Center Ridge Road gets done. Thank you. You're welcome. Guy at Danbury, when they build the cottages, the, the, the minimal assisted living, yes. Would that be one tap or would that be a tap for each one of those buildings? For like sewer? Well, they'll run a, a eight inch sewer line down through there, but the city engineer told me it's going to be $5,000 and some change sewer taps for each unit. Okay. And I forget how many units there are down there, like 20 more. 20 some units. The, the big surprise was they're going to do condos over on uh, Spencer Court and Tractor. Each building is going to have eight units in it. 
and the engineers told me that the sanitary sewer is going to be forty thousand dollars for each. In, in essence, about forty thousand for each unit, each um, building. I'm sorry. There's some significant revenue. We'll see what the owner has to say when he hears that figure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't calculate the fees. No, nope. it is what it is. I do, but I don't set the fees. City sure. council does. What when was he planning on building those houses behind the firehouse? I have plans down there right now. Really? really? He has to tell us which unit he wants to start first. He's got to get a uh, uh, what we call a topo, a topographical survey to the city engineer. He failed to do that. He did an overall plan with him. Fire service is also looking at things for their department's coverage because this is an old project that went back to the early 90s. It just kind of went real slow and then just kind of stalled. Uh, so the fire department, you know, it didn't go to planning commission. That's what I was trying to say. It didn't go to planning commission because it had already been there. And they started the project many years ago. So there, was, there wasn't an assessment to return. So um, the fire department wants to look and make sure, because things change, rules change, their equipment changes, it's gotten bigger and better, and they want to make sure that everything is adequately addressed on these new condos. So they're sure. looking at it right now. I, I believe the city engineer probably took a lot of that into account when he approved the site plan. So I like said that he's worked out the access then with the... Nope. No. no. <laughs> and like Tony Morgan said, I can give him a permit, but I can't tell him they can cross that those people's property, that he's got to figure that out for himself. That's a civil matter. I know he's approached the city to go through fire station too, but I don't know that that's the best idea for the city. And he's also approaching the storage unit people to go through there. So he's still submitted the plans anyway. Yes, sir. Yes. So this might not be budget related, but is there anything that, you know, you said he submitted these plans back in the 90s. The overall plan for the development of the condos. This is a different individual. This isn't the original owner. So isn't there a time frame that they are Not given? once they start. The, the North Ridgeville's ordinance says once you start turning the first shovel full, that the, the time limit for a planning commission to have to go back and get reapproved is off the table. Same way with BZA. If you hadn't started them, there's a two-year window. But once you start, there's no window as to how long it takes them. Because look at metal legs. They've been building metal legs for 20 years. Same way with Waterbury. They get approval for each phase, but the overall plan was approved 20 years ago. So we don't we don't put an end window on there. And that's same held for the, the condos. That's for any subdivision. As far as wish list is concerned, more office space. We want a million dollars in the car loan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't. I don't have a crystal ball, and this is just my opinion. But what I'm seeing out there in, in the real world, we may be seeing the end of urban sprawl. Um, we're starting to run out of lots and subdivision. So that might be something that city council wants to be thinking about in the future, because you know you realize every new house permit we issue, we take in two hundred fifty dollars for parks and rec. If that revenue source is gone, if we're no longer building two and three hundred house starts a year, that's going to have an effect on departments like park and rec. So council may want to figure out well what are we going to do in regards to that down the road and start giving us some thought and planning. Yeah, that, that's something that I've talked about for a few years now that, you know, when the growth starts to slow down or stop, it'll be like we hit a financial brick wall because we have lived off of growth for such a long time and taken it basically for granted at this point. But uh, there's a lot of fees that come in from everything from tap fees to building fees to you know, like a, basically both engineering and building are supported off the projects that go on in the city. And uh, if there's no projects going on, then they just become a cost as opposed to breaking even. 
So that is something that you know everybody needs to be yeah. cognizant of as we move forward. And if anybody's Question. done any recent um, trips into Cleveland, it's amazing what Cleveland's doing with new housing down there. You know, they're they're going into Tremont and other areas up by the Cleveland Clinic, and they're just rebuilding the city with new housing. That just amazed me when I drove drove through parts of, of Cleveland, all the new housing that was in there, I was floored. I didn't realize that they were doing things like that. So sure. the prediction that I heard when I was a, a, a teenager of everything returning to the central city, here we are, what, 50 years later, and we're starting to see that. Yeah, we've been, um, uh, my bank has been helping developers in the uh, uh, Tremont, uh, Ohio City, um, the uh, area along Detroit Road, uh, all the way to 117th, uh, which is the Detroit Shoreway uh, CDC area, um, all the way um, uh, up north to 71, um, or south to 71. Uh, that's been a resurgence for years. And, uh, you know, there's good developers that are um, individual developers, not just big, big ones, who will buy a, a couple lots, refurbish it, and then that, you know, creates other opportunities for other people to do the same thing to, to reclaim the neighborhood. So that's something that's been going on. For a long I'm not trying to be a naysayer. We still have land to develop in the city. It's going to be becoming more challenging to put it together and get access to it, but it can be done. But whether or not we're going to see that that growth that we've seen in the past, and I think there's a possibility that we could see it, you know, greatly slow down or eventually diminish and disappear. And you're you're right about the uh, partner rec improvement fund fee, the 250. Uh, many years ago, I talked uh, with several different councils on how to increase that, and we found legally that the only way, the main way that you could increase that 250, understanding at some point it was going to go away, so let's build it up, was that you had to target a specific project for that. That's the only way you just couldn't arbitrarily say, okay, now instead of 250, it's 500 because the developers would fight it and they win. But if you said, we're going for 250 to 500 to fund this recreation center and earmark it for that, then you had you know, some, some something to hold back on, but we never could do that because we never had the rest of the money to put towards the rec center or, or anything like that. So those, those funds are, you know, the only way to, to come out of that is to take it from the general fund right now, those funds offset things that would normally come from the general fund. And so, you know, to your point, we need to continue to look for things like that. That's one thing the auditor has done, um, you know, this year and in previous years is to make sure that we spend the earmark money for special funds first. So there's not a drain on the general fund so that we can do other things. So you're absolutely right. I don't I don't know the immediate answer to that other than no, I'm this just is trying to make people fund. aware just to have it on their mind for a future fund so you don't get blindsided. The uh, other question I would have, and I'm not sure if it has anything to do with the budget, but uh, is there anything council can do to help with the enforcement of uh, maintenance and property condition issues? The only thing that I could think of, um, I believe needs to come from the fire service. I've been preaching to the fire service that they should generate a permit fee for new businesses or just in, in existing businesses for annual inspection. Because right now they have a one man inspection team and I don't believe that it's enough. I think he needs some help to adequately keep up with existing businesses to make sure they're safe for the occupants of the residents to go in there. Because we go into some of these older buildings and you wouldn't believe some of the things they're finding. And it'd be nice if the fire service uh, could get in there once a year because once I issue a certificate of occupancy, I'm out of the picture. By state law, it's under the jurisdiction of the fire service. So they have a one man fire prevention person right now and, and you know, I mentioned this to the chief and I don't know what his feeling is or how he wants to approach it, even if he wants to approach it, but I seriously think it's something that needs to be considered. Mr. President, or Mr. Yes. Mr. Chairman, yes. again, I apologize for being late. I was in Pittsburgh, so my apologies if you've already answered this, but um, 
is there any capital projects that you need or that you uh, need to then include in here for our consideration in the future that we should you know keep in mind going forward? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, you know, technology is ever changing, but we're fairly well set up with computer programs and tablets. We've got decent vehicles. Um, I remember when I started here in 1992, we were getting cast off police cars. And I, I, I swore I'd put a gas tank on every other one of those because <laughs> they were leaking in the parking lot out there. But no, um, we're pretty well staffed and pretty well set up. Um, I would think at least for the next couple of years. Thank you. Well, I've, again, I will speak to everyone for, for myself. I want to thank you and all the um, individuals in your department for all you do. I, I know uh, I've talked to you many, many times. You work 26 hours a day often, and I don't know how you do it. And I'm sure other uh, members of your team do that as well. And uh, you, I believe you utilize the tools that you have with all of the development going on, with all the instructions you have to do, with all of the reports you have to you know, complete extremely well. And, and um, I'm only as I good as the thank people. You for it. You're welcome. I'm only as good as the people that work for me and they do a good job. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Thank Sorry, you guys. I got a little bit sidetracked, but Thank I you. thought that information might be helpful. Thank All information is helpful. I've heard of it. Bye tomorrow. See you later, guys. Have a good one. Okay, have a good day. It was well. Take care, everybody. Be safe.
Yes. Thank you. Mr. Pugers, thank you for coming. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, I'll let you get started with summarizing and Thank you. Um, uh, just a brief over review of 2020. Um, obviously, we've seen a downturn in revenue brought on by the pandemic. Uh, at the end of October 2020, our revenue in Department 275 was down 40% compared to 2019. Uh, our restart plan started in July underneath guidance from the Department of Health, uh, Warren County Public Health, and responsible restart Ohio guidelines. Uh, staff was re reassigned during the shutdown with assistance being provided to our ground maintenance department. Um, we, we continue to navigate our programs under a guideline-based philosophy. Uh, our staff has done a tremendous job of altering our programs so, so we can keep everybody safe during these instances. 
Um, in June, uh, North Ridgeville Heart and Soul Fitness Trail opened uh, to the general public. To the general public, uh, we are pleased to add another trail system to our park system. Uh, the trail obviously was made possible by the Nature Works grant through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, a monetary donation of fifteen thousand dollars from the North Ridgeville Heart and Soul Challenge and, uh, and uh, Parks and Recreation's Improvement Fund to finish up the remaining balance on that trail. Um, a restroom project, which was slated for uh, 2020, uh, is slated to be completed in 2021. Um, our grounds maintenance department, our maintenance, tech maintenance technician position was not filled and remains vacant. Uh, currently, we have four uh, full-time staff members, uh, one assistant grounds maintenance supervisor, Sexton, and along with three laborers. Uh, normal staff available is our five, so currently we're down 20% in our staff. Uh, we did hire two seasonal employers over the summer to help with our grounds maintenance department to maintain the 117 acres of public and park land. Um, in September, maybe, uh, we applied through NAWACA uh, for their TLC implement, implementation planning grant. Uh, we'll anticipate hearing anything uh, around uh, March in 2021. Uh, if you do get the funding, it's about, you probably won't be started until late fall, fourth quarter of 2021. Um, we also applied through ODNR and the Land Water Conservation Fund grant for funding of a new playground in South Central Park. Uh, we anticipate hearing whether or not we received that grant in February or March also. Uh, Nicholas Bolowski, uh, he, is, he was hired as our new recreation supervisor. Uh, Nicholas takes over from Brandon, uh, who received a new position with the Milwaukee School District. Uh, Nicholas will be starting on Monday, November 23rd, and he comes from Perkins Township. And uh, we had 127 resumes in a week. So uh, outlook for 2021, uh, our trails uh, during the winter months, uh, we are keeping them open to our general public. Uh, our grounds maintenance department will be plowing and salting them all winter long. Uh, the biggest reason is obviously with the current pandemic to allow our residents a outlet for not only their mental health, but also their physical health. So. Uh, we will be keeping our trail systems open. Um, we plan on applying for a nature works grant through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources to help with the South Central Park playground. Uh, the grant is due on or before the state by June 1st. Hope is to pair the land water conservation grant along with the, uh, with the nature works grant to alleviate expenses of this project. As I previously stated, uh, the new restroom facilities at Shady Drive Complex will be constructed in, in 2021. Our hope is to hire and bring out a, a maintenance technician for the grounds maintenance department. Um, and obviously we continue to operate our programs in a world that COVID-19 is present. Uh, we're following all COVID-19 protocols and guidelines laid out by the state of Ohio and the responsible to restart Ohio guidelines. And obviously uh, we're gonna keep evolving and changing uh, to offer our residents quality programs throughout the fiscal year. Question, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Kevin. Um, great job. Again, I'm, I'm the uh, liaison uh, and member of the Park Rec Commission for Council. And so um, I've been kept aware of, of all the things you just brought up. Um, staff has done a great, great job. So thank you very much. Um, in your uh, capital improvements budget for next year, we have proposed a, a pedestrian bridge in Frontier Park coming out of the uh, Park and Rec Improvement Fund. Um, is that replacing the existing one or just a new one at a different location? Uh, no, it's replacing the existing one. So we're going to replace the one that's there. And is the 71.8, that's the total project? So everything is going to come out of the parking lot and do that one? The fence at the soccer complex, where is that going to be? So we own. So it splits the uh, homeowner's properties uh, between the soccer complex property. Uh, we replaced a little over 300 feet of it. Uh, June, June maybe somewhere around there. Um, we received an insurance claim from wind damage that we experienced in December of 2019. So thankfully we were able to replace almost you know, a little less than half of it. So our goal is to just complete the remaining balance of it. Um, so it's a brand new fence could last us 20, 25 years. 
and the and we're going to move forward this year with the batting cages. Yeah, that's um, correct. Um, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, obviously during the shutdown, I personally did not feel comfortable starting a restaurant project when we were closed, and you couldn't even use them. Um, so. Uh, you know, I just personally felt not comfortable spending that money right at that point in time. Um, so we did put it off and our goal is to obviously have it reopened and, you know, added to the batting cage. So that facility, which is our biggest uh, facility in, in our index that we can use year round for multiple program fronts. And again, uh, uh, great job in the, at the, um, Chitty Drive, the back parking lot turned out wonderful. Great job. Yeah, service credit. Fantastic <laughs> job on that. I've been so happy to see you asphalt. My entire life. So. Thank you. <laughs> Chairman Adams. Oh, thanks. With uh, the South Central Park uh, playground equipment, I see the value of 100000 The current playground equipment there, does it have any value? Is it something that can be sold or what happens to it? So the life expectancy of playgrounds are generally 20 years. Um, that playground was installed in 1997. So it's about 22 years old. Um, we have over the past two to three years started putting more extensive repairs into it uh, because things are breaking. The plastic, obviously, with UV rays and everything like that, starts breaking down. Um, generally, when you remove playgrounds, they're removed because they, you have to follow certain standards. Uh, you know, I have certif I'm a certified playground safety inspector, so there's certain standards that you have to follow to make sure there's a certain cushion underneath a slide based on the height and everything from that standpoint. So generally once the playground is removed, we don't put it back into rotation. It's removed and discarded. Thank you. Uh, as far as the soccer field is concerned, were you able to address some of the concerns of the residents had for drainage issues? I don't. Which drainage issues? The ones that are pertaining oh, to the long root road there. But if they're pertaining to the root road, it's not pertaining to the soccer complex. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think Dan Rodriguez might be working on that, but I don't have right. that specific answer. Thank you. Batting cage bathrooms, is that going to be the restrooms like inside the batting cage or replace the one that's outside and still in a separate building? Uh, the restroom project will be on the outside of the facility. So like the community panel where you have doors flush to the building, because we want, we didn't want to take away square footage in that facility. So they're being added that one that's attached to the grounds maintenance shop will be removed and disbanded. Those bathrooms will be used for obviously our programming needs within that facility and obviously parking. Kevin, did you want to touch on the uh, increase in the cemetery fund? Um, for outside services? Yes. So, outside services in uh, Department 270, which is our cemetery fund. Um, the city owns and maintains three public cemeteries, our, which makes up about eight acres. Uh, our public, so my grad maintenance staff maintains 117 acres worth of parkland. Removing that balance of that takes that down to about 190 acres of maintenance that we would still be maintaining. So those cemeteries make up 7% of our work and take the most time for our grounds maintenance department. On average, they're out there for two and a half, three days, weed whipping and mowing. Fortunately, you can't go through there with certain, you know, you can only use a 48 inch, a 16 inch deck mower. Every headstone has to be weed whipped or maintained. So, Generally, that is our biggest area that we maintain. It's our smallest and only takes up 7% of our workload. Um, our goal was to contract out maintenance and landscape and weed whipping of those three public cemeteries, you know, moving forward. Um, in 2020, we hired on two seasonal staff out of that fund in 270. They generally work 12 weeks, May through July. Um, generally, total expenses for those two, two were $10,000. You know, obviously, if we hire two additional seasonal staff from April through October, it would actually we would actually have a savings of almost seven thousand dollars because you're, you know, that's thirty weeks, thirty-seven point five hours a week by tw you know that's two thousand two hundred fifty hours divided by two people. So based on you know the math that I was doing, we look at you look at a savings of seven thousand dollars by potentially just contracting out the, the mowing and the weed whipping on those public cemeteries. 
Uh, we received a quote from uh, Forever Green Lawn Care uh, a few months ago. Uh, the quote came in at 17.6 for them to do it weekly. Uh, that is still a high book and pricing. Uh, we were told that to estimate that to be 20% less than what we were giving, but they had to give us the book price to start with. So we still anticipate shaving off a potential $3,000 off the book price to maintain those public lands. Obviously, we want to do this to be able to have my staff work more efficiently within our parks built in our public buildings. Not only do we maintain our public parks and public lands, we also, in the packet that I provide you, we do maintain building and park maintenance. You know, City Hall Complex, South Central Park, Shady Drive, Soccer Complex, and Frontier Park. Our staff is currently four members. Obviously, we're down 20%. One guy takes off vacation, we're down another 20%. So we're down 40% in staff. If we can reallocate my staff to be able to not have to concentrate on our three public cemeteries that take any, you know, potentially 2.5 to three days to maintain, so we can actually catch ourselves back up and work more efficiently, I thought that was a win-win for the department and for uh, the city as a whole. Would that potentially cut down on a part on summer health that you hire, or you'll still need the same number of summer health? No, we would not. So we would, in the, like last year, we, it was the first year we brought two seasonal staff out of the two staff. Uh, we would only bring out two seasonal staff uh, moving forward. Those would be facilitated out of the Department 275, which is the Department of Trust Fund. Correct. Um, so we wouldn't add an additional two staffing from that standpoint because, again, that staffing load that was normally maintained for our public cemeteries is, is no longer needed. So there's several you know, areas that, that um, um, uh, taking that out to a third party would do. It yes. Would, you know, yes. make your department more efficient. It would provide additional uh, time to get things that really parks are supposed to get done. And it wouldn't uh, cause any additional um, uh, staffing income or uh, expense. Correct. It's, and like I said, you know, generally, like I said, it's, you know, we, we have carried over over the past four years, $47,000 in the cemetery fund. And obviously, right, you know, we will, we might only carry over, you know, dependent, we'll have to see how the year goes, but I know we have a one-time expense of 11,500 coming out of there for tree, tree removal and tree trimming within our public cemeteries. But on general, we're not really spending any money out of that fund on average, you know. In 2019, we expended 19,000, 18, 22, 2017, 3,400. There's not a lot of high end expenses out there. Um, I also provided in your packet a cemetery fee comparison that I, that I did together with uh, between us and uh, City of Strongsville, City of Bedford, City of Chardon, City of Elyria. So we are potentially looking at increasing our cemetery fees also. You can kind of see on average where we stand out compared to the four other communities that I received information from. So that would that will potentially be brought in front of council to uh, potentially increase those fees for 2021. With the uh, request to um, contract those services out, will that affect any of the requests you currently have for equipment replacement, specifically like the the mower dats that you're requesting? Is that going to be affected by us contracting no. those three cemeteries out? No. Okay. I just also, I guess, going forward in the future, what equipment we not be requesting if we're able to hire somebody else to do that? I can see there's further savings there. Of course, yeah. It, like I said, we we generally in the past have always taken like a mower out of that fund. But, you know, if we're going to have physically somebody maintaining that, that potentially won't be there anymore. Um, I know we're looking to replace, you know, to add two mowers to our system. Again, uh, two 96 inch uh, easy mark uh, mowers. Uh, we, actually demoed a couple of those pieces back in July. You know, they're meant for us to work more efficiently throughout our cities. You know, um, on average, you can maintain 10 acres of land in an hour. Uh, but again, they said you were going like almost 13 miles an hour. We're not even going to keep it for it. So, um, I see my goal since taking over that part has been to try to streamline and work a little bit more efficiently than what we have to do. So, I don't see us having an exorbitant amount of expenses coming out of 270. And obviously after this year, if you guys do approve, you know, that funding of the contracts, obviously we'll have a better feel for how we operate and if we have to make strategic changes from that standpoint. But I think it will alleviate some stress off the guys feeling like they can't get to everything in a, in a short season. Because if normal operating year, we are uh, consistent with the tournaments every weekend in our baseball softball complex as anywhere. Uh, 
program has anywhere between 560 to 590 kids every year. So we're on a constant go, 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 go every year. Um, by possibly bringing that off the table, I can see us actually being more efficient, being able to catch up on maintenance, being able to catch up on things that we're like, we can't get to the fall of winter anyways. So obviously that is our goal. And I, you know, I, I obviously want to see how this works and I think it will work fine. Um, but I know my sexton has <laughs> is nervous because he loves doing what he's doing, but you know, we'll have a contract in place and do those types of things to be able to support us to make sure if there's any damage that that company is, you know, held responsible for those types of things. With the, uh, the contract, how long is the term on that? Uh, the term is just going to be a year because I want to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, if we feel like it was managed well, uh, I could potentially just see us going a two year contract and reevaluating every two years. Uh, but for this upcoming fiscal year, I just want to do a one year contract. Thank you. You're welcome. And currently, we're uh, mowing that every week. Yeah. Weather per permitting. Correct. And the contract would be also weekly weather permitting. Yep. Weather permitting. Where are the 13 spinning bikes going? Uh, Those were originally budgeted and approved in 2020. But, but during, yes. As I, as I previously mentioned, the batting cage is our biggest indoor facility in the year. Uh, that building. Last year, during budget appropriations, that's why we wanted the bathrooms and the, the spinning bikes so we can expand our programming. Where are you going to put the spinning bikes? Within the back end? No, there's going to be a storage on with the new bathrooms. So you have the bathrooms, chase room, men's chase room, women's storage room. Would you mind uh, just going over your request for equipment with us, just yeah, summarizing what the uh, people receive for the purpose? Uh, capital equipment uh, requesting a new uh, truck. Uh, we're wanting to replace our 2009 Chevy. Uh, the truck is obviously 11 years old and it's becoming more of an issue than it's worth. I uh, want to replace it with a 2021 Ford F350. <coughs> um, again, we want to add two Easy Mark Laser Z96 motor decks. Uh, as I previously stated, those motors cut 10 acres in 1.5 hours. Generally, you can cut 80 acres in a normal generally in a work day. How many motors do we currently have now? Uh, we have four 72 inch decks. Um, we have two 60 inch decks and we have two 48 inch decks. If we purchase those, you'll have the manpower to still run those and yep. we can use. Thank you. But again, like the 40 inch deck ones, you're generally only using for yourself. Good. Yeah, because you can't maneuver between the Correct. You got some push motors, don't you? Yeah, because we have to push motors by safety. What's a field groomer? <laughs> uh, Smithsco Sands our field groomer. Uh, it's an infield groomer. Uh, we have two uh, Toro workmans uh, that do the same thing, but this is meant for baseball fields. Uh, so we want to repl replace it with the Smithsco Sandstar. And we trade in one of our workmen that's uh, on its last leg, to <laughs> say the least. So it just grooms your infields, maintains your infields, things like that, that the workman was challenging. Okay. And there's a request for a bobcat? No, uh, no not for this year. No, it's not. Yeah. And then the spinning bikes. Yep. Uh, Kevin, I, I know we have a. Uh, uh, Good balance in the department. Keep in mind, you're comfortable with taking 226000 out this year for the improvements that you've noticed. You have 113 budgeted in the equipment, and then you have another 110000 112000 in the uh, Capex, which includes the uh, town center trail extension and the pedestrian bridge. Your total is, I'm sorry, Dennis, um, your total is 186,560, yeah. right? So I show 71, I show 111, 112, and 113 is 225. Well, but the 113s come from three different funds. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ten thousand is coming from the general, yeah. but the rest is coming from the park. Oh, I'm sorry. Twenty eight is coming from the trust. I'm sorry. So, in Seven part, three. can I improve the um, seventy three thousand seven sixty from equipment outlay? So it's about one eighty five. Yeah, one eighty five. Still, are you comfortable that more than we'll, 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 we'll bring in? So you're okay, you know, getting into that carryover? I guess. Fine. Right. Did you, how many mowers do you have? How many sixties? <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm sorry, guys. I do. Seventy twos. I'm sorry. How many seventy twos? We have four, but we took one that was actually out of stock to fix it because we didn't have enough. So, so I see we're only using generally our forty-eight inches for cemeteries. Like some of these mowers have specific needs. Okay, within our project. The 17, 72 are obviously taking more open field space and doing more quickly. So yeah, we we have some of these mowers are getting older, but again, that H two ninety six inch deck will have us work, you know, more efficiently. How many forties you got? We don't have forties. Oh, well, you don't have forties. Forty eights. Okay. So you got actually six mowers now. Four seventy twos, two sixties. Yep. They're asking for two ninety sixes, yep. and then push mowers. You've got what, two or three? Uh, we don't want one. The push mowers only use for a single. Okay. What about the trimming of the bushes and fall cleanup? Is that all part of the landscape contract now? Of the of cemeteries, the flower cleanup. The flower cleanup is us. Aren't you? Yeah, there. This is strictly the. How about mow. cutting the trimming the bushes and pulling the weeds and all that? No. no. Okay. Yeah, we trim. Obviously, we'll trim those hedges. That would be you guys too, though. Yeah. And fall cleanup of leaves and stuff would be you guys. Yeah, we every fall we mulch. <coughs> every season we go go in and mulch throughout the park system. But again, cemeteries would be handled by. Just the mowing weed whack. Any further questions, comments? Mr. Bruckner, thank you very much for your time. Thank Greatly you. appreciate it. Thank you. I know it's been a tough year for you. Yeah, it's a tough <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On deck now? No, they'll be tomorrow at 9 a.m. What's next? That is the end of the presentations for today. Um, I guess my, my question to the committee is um, usually after we're done hearing all the departments, then we um, start talking about you know what, what you've heard and any changes or comments and questions, concerns that you may have. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that would happen tomorrow. Is that correct? Okay. Usually we have a chance to hear all the departments talking on Wednesdays to get an idea of what the priorities are. Sure. Um, and I will say so far, I'm really impressed with everybody. They've all trimmed their budgets. I'm pretty sure they may always threaten them. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> Gently. Yeah. But no, no, I was really impressed with everybody that's come across this today. That, that has really obviously made conscious efforts to make cuts in their budgets. Um, there's an understanding of what's going on out there. The request for equipment and um, not a whole lot, obviously, for additional personnel makes sense. It really does. And I, I'm kind of really happy to see that everybody's kind of on the same page with this. That, you know, we're all trying to work this out together for what's best for our community and, and keep the economic environment, you know, in mind as well. So, great job, by the way. This is very organized. Are there any departments that, that
that we are not seeing that requested to uh, make a presentation? Yeah. Okay. Again, I know these are the major departments, but I did want to make sure that all departments knew and it was in the record for the council meeting that if they wanted to make a presentation, that they make a presentation. Yeah, that's correct. The offer was not there, but Thank you. Okay, again, I apologize for not being here this morning. I had a late uh, meeting called earlier this morning at 8.30 in Pittsburgh that I found out about at about 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon. So my apologies. Uh, I will make personal contact with all the presenters from this morning, follow up with them since I wasn't here to hear the presentation. Again, I apologize. Councilman Boos, you can also watch this on YouTube. It'll be on after if you want to hear things in preparation for tomorrow. When's it going to be on YouTube? Now. Okay. Forever. I'll still contact them. Forever. Forever. <laughs> All right. It's a wrap. This afternoon's meeting is adjourned. We return tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock.